bring you down and I'll bring you right back up. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Sean. I am here on the internet to discuss what is known as critical race theory. We will be going over all the important topics like what even is this? Why even should we even have this in school even? And what are the differences in opinion that me and my special guest, Justin, have? Okay, some, something's happening. Okay, I, I just got some crazy ad audio. Uh, I don't know where it came from. It messed up my intro, but th that's neither here nor there. So yeah, um, I'm joined today by my special guest, Justin. He's at the uh, SJW Debates channel. All his links are in the description. He's also simulcasting on Twitch. If you want to check him out, uh, here he is. He is now viewable for all of you. Say hi to the people, Justin. Hello, people. Everyone, everyone. Hello. Messing with stuff on my end, too. This is a boomer tier stream on all accounts, but there's a certain charm to that, I think. Oh, so what happened on my end was the stream I had up to make sure we were live started playing an ad, and it was a song blaring in my ear. So nice. it was all by myself, which is... Weird, because I didn't have you up on screen, so it kind of fit. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. All right, so uh, you wanted to talk to me about critical race theory, and uh, like, because I've been doing a couple of talks, I really one officially, and then one I popped in on about like this coming into the classrooms. Obviously, a bunch of Republican legislatures are banning it. A bunch of school boards have parents. It's this whole like song and dance and all that. Um, so I guess the first question I would ask you is. Are you in favor of critical race theory being taught in the classroom? And if so, what would be your objections to the bands that we're seeing across the country? Generally, the answer is yes. Obviously, there's going to be certain individual instances where I think eh, maybe we should uh, rethink the way this specific thing is being implement, uh, implemented in this specific scenario. But I think broadly, critical race theory offers a good perspective that helps us like we know it helps us know more rather than less about uh, the way the world works and about how like we can engage both on the staff level, like how staff can engage with students in a way that is a little bit more pedagogically uh, useful. We get a little bit more utility out of how the staff like uh, interact with the students, as well as for the the kids to engage in some critical thinking skills. And I think there's ways to make that age appropriate, uh, basically from kindergarten up to twelve. Now, obviously, like the, the, what what we have for a kindergartner is going to look way different than what we assign to uh, you know a senior in high school. But I think there are levels that that it would be appropriate for all levels. And I think some of the I think uh, I have two main concerns about how it's being like broadly banned. Uh, I don't, not at the federal level, but I was like across country, not federally, but you know, across the country. One, it seems to be like, like not reactive, but it seems to be like proactive, but not in a good way. Like it's addressing a problem that really doesn't exist. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with like the, the backlash to like last summer, the BLM protests, uh, this like awakening that a lot of us, that a lot of people had. I think a lot of it's in response to that as well as like a lot of the language is pretty broad. Like it, it's, it, would limit teachers ability to discuss sensitive topics like one of the uh i can't remember off the top of my head and, I, and i'm sorry for this but one of the proposed bans was like uh it's you know you can't make anybody uncomfortable on account of the race and i think that's a, that sounds good in theory but also like you know it, that seems like it'd be broadly abused like if we had a a, a current uh, curriculum in which we talked about slavery and, it, and we talked about like the historical like uh scenarios that impact us to this very day and there are some like white kids are like well wait a second that makes me feel bad it makes me feel like you know uh, uh you know it, it makes me feel kind of bad knowing that you know that other people who don't look like me have it worse than me could you could that be overly like could we extend that to be overly broad to like ban those kinds of discussions so i'm just concerned about the over broad applicability so i know you have different thoughts on that so right. i'll stop talking so i uh, to, to your point about like uh, a law that says you can't make any individual student feel uncomfortable, I do think that's that that's ridiculous. Like uh, being uncomfortable is so subjective and irrelevant. Like, it, yeah, like yeah, I'll it, enough, you know where I heard that from? Where? Uh, Jordan Peterson of all people. Like it seems like he was discussing a, a law that was designed to like uh, ban critical race theory or at least uh, some approximation of it. But like even he was stepping in and saying like this isn't good. So I just thought that was a neat anecdote. Right. Yeah. So like I, I, the, to this, to the extent, and I haven't seen that provision of law, so I'm just going to take your word for it. 
to the extent that like you're saying you can't make any student uncomfortable like that's really weird like if you taught if you taught um like the history of world war ii and you had a german kid and he was like i felt uncomfortable it's not like that means you can't talk about the holocaust please take or, that with a grain of salt yeah. it's something that i half remember from like a, yeah a month so ago. i'm just saying so like to that point we agree I think the 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 problem that I have every time I end up discussing uh, critical race theory is that, like, for me, or at least my understanding of it, it's not about like not teaching the history of slavery or or not teaching the history of the civil rights movement. I think we would both agree that that should be taught in the school, and like we've had that taught in schools pre critical race theories implementation or like you know even if it's on a local level, the implementation of critical race theory in certain curriculums. So I guess like the question I would ask you is what's the distinction between the current like curriculum about like where we teach about the history of slavery, the history of the civil war, um, the history of racism in the country and the civil rights uh, and the civil rights act and a critical race theory curriculum that, that would cover that. So I need to acknowledge like one thing. One, the level that we're talking about right now is way at much more of a, a nuanced high, high. We're engaging in some high level ideas that just that's not what the conversation is in a lot of like the broad public. A lot of the broad public has CRT as a stand in for any sort of uh, training that's wants to address racism directly. So I want to acknowledge that first. But yeah, this CRT is not simply acknowledging the harm that has resulted from racist policies in the past. There is a very much distinction there. So in my view, to sum it up way to sum it up concisely in a way that's also you know way overly reductive crt is a lens that we can view certain events in history and uh current events that places race at, at the forefront that, that places that as the most uh relevant factor to which we are discussing now a lot of people takes that take that to mean that that means that crt says that race is the only important factor but this simply isn't the case it's just using race as the primary factor in this lens so it's not and this is something crt is very 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 good about uh making up front is this is not the correct way to view something it's offering a different perspective that you might not have considered before and i think that's important i think that expands critical thinking rather than shrinks it so this this notion that like critical race theory is saying that all problems are always due to racism they can always be traced back to this one this only variable this is the only thing that's ever mattered this isn't true within uh, critical race theory and i think it does a disservice to the discussion on all sides to try to make this inter uh, to try to make this like description of CRT that simplistic, right? I I would I would say it's probably more broad than than the than people who like narrowly say it's like everything is due to race. And I've seen a lot of people get into like Robin DiAngelo or Ibram X Kendi. Uh, I'm really certain, like 99 percent certain, that Robin DiAngelo is not a critical race theory scholar. I think her background's in education, so. Um, that's just like a name that's really popular. So like, I don't want to get into her. Ibram X. Kendi's a little, little mixture because, you know, he might not be a scholar in the field, but he definitely, like his writings definitely seem like he's read enough critical race theory and he's building on that. But, um, as for the, the, the idea it's race, isn't the only factor. And like, I don't want to say that any or all of these people, I think all is better because any, any individual can. Um, say race is the only factor, but it's definitely like a primary factor. Like the distinction between it and critical theory is that it emphasizes race. Like, is well, that yeah, not that, correct? I mean, that's the purpose of the lens, right? Like queer theory looks at heteronormativity. Uh, feminism looks at like gender relations. Like this, that's kind of the point of the theory is to place race front and foremost. Like, uh, and I think a lot of people confuse that with these theories say that these are the only factors when no, it's just a different lens through which to view things. And I think that a di offering a different perspective on the same thing, I think is one of the biggest benefits that that these kind of theories can give us like it is it is good to like question the norms question the status quo question the assumptions that you made going into your interpretation of a historical event or a piece of media or something like that i think it's good to have these theories that like put a different perspective on it i think it gives us even if you disagree with it this is something by the way all right i want to say a bad word i want to say postmodernism. okay this is something i actually really think is awesome uh that like you can get value from hearing a different perspective because you vehemently disagree with it like listening to a, a perspective on something that you absolutely hate 
has just as much utility and provides just as much value to your understanding of the scenario as listening to something that you agree with. The example I always use is like you don't really appreciate good filmmaking until you see a bad film and have someone explain to you why the film is bad, what techniques did they use or not use, and that helps you better understand the good stuff. So I think it has a lot more value existing than not existing. All right, so you're already playing into you're playing into uh, into into me, the, the host, which is really nice because uh, I learned to edit in film production. So I love watching bad movies because it it shows you like the mistakes and all that, and when stuff is inappropriately in, inserted in film language. So I you know I, I, I see yeah, what like you're when doing. you see I, I never noticed this before, but like if if you have a shot reverse shot dialogue scene in bad movies, it seems really 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 stilted, even though the dialogue right. kind of if you just listen to it, it's fine. And the reason is they just they cut the video and the audio the same, whereas in good films, they'll have that little J cut that, that mimics yeah. human like movement. It's something I would never have like understood or noticed. Like I knew what a J cut was. I didn't understand why it was important until I saw it explained. Okay. Here's what it's absence looked like in this bad movie. Right. Well, one of my, one of my things in film and I don't want to get off into a tangent is there's like certain basic rules and typically like a good filmmaker would know the rules before they break them. And one of the things you notice in a lot of bad movies is that, like they don't know the purpose of the rules or maybe don't even know that those rules exist. So they're just breaking them randomly. Like a perfect example is Michael Bay's latest Transformers movie where the movie changes aspect ratio, like just randomly. And it's because he shot everything on three cameras and he's just shooting. <laughs> he's just switching between the cameras. So well, was uh, it battlefield earth? Like they use Dutch angles for no reason whatsoever. Or I mean, yeah. I, I do like the first Thor movie, but they they Dutch angled the crap out of that movie, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. As Guardians are weird, like I, I, just bring it, bring it down. But a Dutch um, angle, a Dutch angle could be the name of the next critical theory. <laughs> so, so in terms of like, in terms of critical race theory, so I in college, look, I, I have reservations about how the federal government funds universities and all that, but like. In college, you have to choose to major in this stuff or, or take elective classes in it. So there's like more of there's like more of an aspect of choice. Like I understand why parents don't want a theory that's like constructed to like, you know, like it's supposed to challenge like the liberal order and the idea of colorblindness, things that, you know, while in academia are not believed to be necessarily goods are considered like values of the broader society. So like I can understand some of, and I, I I mentioned this in the in the um, the Destiny versus uh, Riley thing, and like we have to remember it's like children. Anytime there's children, you know, uh, that character from The Simpsons, somebody think of the children. So I get the passion about it because it's like people feel like they don't have control of their children's education or they're being taught something that is like politically biased. And critical race theory scholars often say that they incorporate their bias. And I understand the reason why they say it's because they don't believe in unbiased social science. They believe that like, even like the, the idea of seeking some kind of objectivity, it's like not, it's not doable. So like they actively incorporate their bias and like that leads to like, I think this is partisan results. I, yeah. I think that this is one of the things I agree with most in CRT is that like, it's questioning like built in assumptions. If you think that's that, that any classroom is unbiased, it kind of that's just not true. It's like assuming that your perspective is the unbiased one, assuming that the defaults, the norms in your society are unbiased in and of themselves. I think that can lead to, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's worth questioning. Like, are the assumptions that you've been taught your entire life correct? And the answer to that sometimes will be yes. Right? It's not saying to reject all assumptions. And this is another like critique of critical race theory that I think misses the point. Like the critique of liberalism is something that like really, really scares a lot of people. Why is that bad? Like, I mean, obviously, if you're conservative, you might be like uh, gung ho about it. And then uh, but if you're a liberal, like, wait a second, why is why are you critiquing all the awesome things like colorblindness and meritocracy and all that cool stuff? It's not saying to reject them saying to question them a little bit so for uh so here, here's an example so like colorblind policy even like so in the uh the main textbook that i'm using for like my here's my grounding of what critical race theory is is hold on i need to uh critical race theory and introduction the third edition by richard delgado and gene staff Stif and gene. gene gene hackman 
sure, Gene Hackman. Uh, that's what I'm basing it on. And uh, what they they say explicitly, they hate colorblindness can be good. It can be a great thing to strive towards in certain scenarios. However, it can also result in bad things if you ignore uh, like actual suffering due to race. Like wanting racism to not be a thing of the past is, or, or wanting racism to be a thing of the past is awesome. And if you if you try to go forward not seeing race, that's awesome. But it also might make you blind to a lot of things. Here's a really uh, a really good example, like uh, like post uh, civil rights era, like 1970s and stuff. There were a lot of swimming pools and and public areas were being integrated, and uh, a lot of white people really didn't like that, uh, like vehemently opposed it, like uh, oftentimes with violence. And so the solution there was to shut down public swimming pools. Now, was that a racist policy? A colorblind lens of the law would say no, because they didn't deny black people the access to those uh, public places. They denied it to everybody. And so there was no, you know, there wasn't any sort of like racial animosity there. But if you actually look at it through a different lens, like use some interpretation, use some inductive reasoning and look at uh, and look at some personal narratives of the time. It's pretty easy for us to say, you know, hindsight uh, 50 years ago, it's pretty easy for us to say, no, this was obviously done for very explicitly racist means. I mean, I. I mean, I might even dispute that it was done for racist means. If you're having a situation where there's like a ton of violence at like these swimming pools, they become unmanageable for the state. So even though the violence might be rooted in racism, like the fact is, is like you still have to deal with that violence. So like you're trying to get rid of almost like a like a focal point of this violence. But like I understand I understand the perspective is that it's like rather than integrate shut it down which would be the position probably of the race of like the racist people that were doing the attacks like not definitely like, likely like, well, if we can't like, legally, yeah if we can't legally deny black people access to the space we're just going to shut it down it, it would likely be their first position like they're you know they're i'm the second position their first position would be like no integrated swimming pools right and then i guess their second position is well rather not than integrated i guess i mean uh, and I think this is an important like lens from which to view things. If you only learn about the civil rights uh, movement and your interpretation of the civil rights movement is that racism ended there because now it's illegal. Well, it's kind of like looking back on like, uh, what's, what's that? that club penguin meme wait someone's murdering you they can't do that that's illegal well racism still happened like that gavel hitting the hitting the whatever the gavel well, hits didn't magically cure racist attitudes and people can work around it it turns out when you say uh when you view racism as something that is explicit purposeful and overt you miss a lot of stuff that's where color, that's what the big critique of colorblindness you miss all but the biggest most bombastic displays of racism and you and you miss all the uh, well, little stuff I, I think it's like a bit of a straw man to say that even our curriculums currently teach that racism ended with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Like I'm I don't, not saying that, I'm not saying that's that. what they teach, but I'm saying that if you come away with that, and like, which there, yeah. there's a, but there's a series of court cases that like follow that up. That basically everything has been litigated, right? And and I used to design courses for public administration, and we'd have people come in, and it's like. Yeah, a lot of people are like, didn't we sue the pants off of everybody for like sexual harassment in the workplace and and all this stuff? And it turns out like these stuff, uh, this stuff does crop up every now and again. And there are individual instances. So I'm fine to like teach that that exists. But I think fundamentally there's like an idea in in critical or there's ideas in critical race theory that I would be opposed to. Like a lot of a lot of the justification for uh, black separatists like can be or a lot of i don't i don't want to say black separatists base their justification on it because like liberia exists in part because people are like we should separate out afterwards like the the plessy versus ferguson case uh, i i don't i'm not sure if this is a writing from the decision but there's uh there's like adjoining writings whenever there's supreme court cases explicitly says like the 14th amendment was not meant to facilitate the co-mingling of the races like so that's why they decided on separate but equal and like, of course, we know that like in most circumstances, separate was not equal, which is why we have Brown versus Board of Ed. So like, sure, but like, there's like when we get into like sketchy territory, like cultural genocide, the idea that any kind of assimilation is like the dominant culture, like literally, gen or not literally, but figuratively genociding the minority culture. Like, I don't want that included in the curriculum, and I think it's harmful in our schools to be like 
to be kind of like separating out our students in that way. Like black kids need to learn this way. Uh, it actually happens a lot in California where they're trying to offer more, sorry for bumping my mic. They want to offer more um, like Spanish language introduction rather than like the ESL or ELL program. I know it's one or the other across the country. So well, I think there's our, an interesting conversation to be had there, right? So this is, and this is something that CRT brings up. It was brought up in that textbook. This, they don't, so the, again, the CRT textbook that I uh, read, and I'm not saying that this is the, this is what CRT is all the time. You know, it, it's complicated. And I think that's, a, 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 I see that as a strength rather than a weakness, that there's nuance and uh, and debate within the field, debate with, uh, between scholars. I see that as, a, as a, a strength rather than a weakness. But they talk about, you know, nationalism versus assimilation. Like if you, they even uh, like propose like two good dudes. They say both of them have their points. One is a dude who, uh, a black guy who wears a suit, who has uh, working at a prestigious law firm, who is working, trying to work within the system. And the other is like, no, I want to wear my dreadlocks uh, because they're, they you know, have cultural significance to me. I'm going to wear uh, clothes that represent like who I am. And I'm not going to say that a suit is what I ought to wear in order to be considered a professional because that is assimilating into the culture rather than making, making my culture a part of the broader culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, I understand it, but I, I don't I don't think assimilation is bad. Like, I think I think assimilation what, is what, neutral. I think I think what actually happened, I think it's actually good. Like when people assimilate, they become more integrated and we become like more like unified overall. And like the reason I like the melting pot analogy, even though it's like falling out of favor and this has nothing to do with critical race theory, but it's like falling out of favor is because when you melt something into a pot, it's like. Sure, it becomes a part of what's overall in there, but it does change the component. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it does. I say assimilation is neutral. It can be good, but it can be bad, right? Because a lot of times, your assim uh, the assimilation is not the melting pot analogy. It's not you put two things in there and they both meld. Oftentimes, assimilation is you have to lose or leave behind a large part of your culture in order to be in order to make it uh, via the rules that have been set by the dominant culture. Uh, again, that, not, that's not always that is neutral. That's not always bad. If uh, part of your culture is beheading gay people, I'm glad that you assimilated into into ours. I'm, that's awesome. But we also have to look at it as like, is that good? Like, are we really tolerant of other people's differences? If like, the only way we can be tolerant is when you show that you're exactly like us, I think there's a conversation to be had there that it can't be you know simplified into this like no assimilation always good and no separatism always bad. I, I think it's I, good to have like different perspectives and different cultures and commingling yeah. with each other. Look. I, look, I live I live in New York City. It's one of the most diverse places on, and I hate to make the food argument. And the food's delicious. Like, er, everybody should come visit. I'll take you to a nice Greek restaurant. Uh, not everybody, actually. If you find out where I live, do not come visit me. Uh, but Justin, if you come to New York, I'll take you to a nice Greek restaurant. It'll, it'll be fun. Uh, but, like, Duh, I I'm guess, like, lose weight. Why are you trying to sabotage me? Uh, it's seafood. It's, it's healthy. It's Mediterranean diet. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, it's probably not. But I'll, like, the reason... Are like one of the main issues, and I and I brought this up in each conversation I've had, and it comes from like Patricia Williams and a and a character named uh, Gary Peller. Uh, has to do with like ebonics, which I mean, you could correct me. It's African American English vernacular or vernacular English. A, -A, -A V E African American vernacular English. Just what it's called right. now. I mean. So, um, like there's there's this I, there's this idea in their writings and like i don't have the the text right in front of me like i did for the destiny debate but i could pull it up if if necessary that because like you can communicate within the black community effectively or within black communities effectively with the ebonics or uh african american vernacular english then then that makes it just as valid as like your standard american english but like it just doesn't and we and in schools like we should not like be catering to this because it causes negative downstream effects for black students like their here's reading the scores critique of that so here's the crt critique of it and here's like my, my thoughts on that what i think that having a shared language like having a shared uh like you know I'm just about to say shared language again. Having a shared language is good. When, when we agree on rules, that's the only way language functions is if we agree on what the rules are. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So if we look at like textbooks, those should be as standard as possible. Now, one caveat to that is why ought students uh, have to learn a specific mode of English in order to uh, communicate with uh, textbooks instead of 
or rather, or instead of alongside of textbooks modifying their language to better communicate with students. It's kind of this like, should teachers communicate to their students or should students uh, just position themselves so in order to learn from I, the teachers? I, I think I think I'll answer like that question. So the the reason why is because the textbooks, the scholarship, all this history that is written in like a standard English language, it already exists. Like that's where we are. And there were there well, of were course, problems. language language changes, right? Why not sure. change it to be more like? Uh, sure, but but there are problems. Like there are, pro and of course, language evolves. Like we all understand that. But like, uh, like uh, let's move it out of America. So um, the Germanic people had a written language before uh, most people in Eastern Europe, right? They developed it after, and that gave them an advantage. It's one of the reasons why, like breweries across the country because like written language it's easier to communicate information like uh, we all understand this so, like i don't want to go too much into it one of the reasons and why I, and I, brewery... clear, I think i think having a common language is yeah. a good thing so but like i had a second point but please continue it's, it's one of the reasons why breweries across like the world are all even the one even the most famous one in chinese or uh, i'm sorry in china are all german founded like for the most part obviously exemptions blah 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 when Eastern Europeans wanted to learn trades because they did not have the written language, uh, they did not have the history of written language, thus they could not pass information down as effectively, they had to learn German to learn their trades. Like the, to get educated, they had to get, learn, take on a second language. I don't think it's too much to ask for, like if English is one of the international languages of business, it's indisputable. In India, they're learning proper English. In China, they're learning proper English a lot of the places to ask like natural born American citizens to, or to emphasize for natural born American citizens that they should learn the proper language where that will give them access to all this scholarship and anything that they're gonna learn in the future is basically gonna be written in this, in this more standard language. And we see reports about like cultural bias on the SATs because black people don't use certain words like that are common well, among so the white community. Like second point, right? Bring and it's like, like but part of, part of that is like, yeah, we need to like we need to get everybody so, yeah, on the same we, page. We do need a and yeah, we do need that common language. But textbooks are not the only method by which we uh, convey language. When we get into things like literature, English classes, like uh, you know, uh, reading classes, like the at the uh, absence of a lot of like uh, varied works from people of different backgrounds, like. I think that's a that's doing a disservice to your students, like introducing someone to a story that is written in a dialect that you might not be familiar with. Effortful reading is great. It helps you understand people better. It helps you, uh, you know, helps you absorb information better when you're effort, effortfully like working through a sentence to try to make out what they're saying. That's like been proven to be very, very beneficial for a lot of students. So introducing this. So when we have like literature courses. We've got Shakespeare at the top. Shakespeare, beautiful language, incredible language. But how much of that is informed by the notion that beautiful language sounds like Shakespeare. You could have beautiful language coming from a lot of different places and they're using a different dialect. Here's a really good example of why it shouldn't be in one direction, right? Why why talking about language should not be just towards what is considered proper. So do you talk to a lot of boomers online? Uh, I maybe. I got How know. about emails? Do you send emails back and forth with boomers and stuff? I, I've sent emails before, so I'll, I'll let you continue, but I'm not very active in the I emails. Know, I got you. So there's, in my opinion, a very, very convincing argument to be made that the way that we communicate via email is way different than uh, – that prose is very, very different than how we communicate in, in other areas. Younger people who are more accustomed to communicating online, we start to develop a certain vernacular, a certain style of typing, a certain style of writing that is way more conducive to that online environment. And it's not just – out of nowhere it's not just informal it almost becomes the new correct thing like if you ever gotten a text and that text ended with a period and that scared the shit out of you because a text <laughs> that ends with a period is serious I, it's a little bit funny but also like unironically like if I, I get a text and it ends with a period like hey meet me upstairs period fuck what did i do wrong versus hey meet me upstairs no period oh cool i would argue that depending on the emotion you're trying to convey if i'm not in trouble Removing the period, breaking the boundaries, breaking the conventions of proper English is the correct thing to do because it helps us communicate more effectively. And so that 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 I just want to like yeah show I, the value of going of that meeting in the middle is not we should meet in the middle rather than only everyone goes towards proper I, English. So like I I think. Like a lot of the points you brought up are are valid, right? And there's actually the reason I was laughing is there's an article that says that millennials, if you use punctuation in in your um 
in, in what you call, if you use punctuation in your text, like properly, like they get anxious. So like periods, like create anxiety, but, yeah. um, the symbols convey, convey meaning, right? Yeah. But I, my, my point is, is to confine it to the schools and sure you can communicate and there's like, you know, quicker ways of communicating. People use emojis and all that. I can't stand whenever I type something on Venmo and they keep trying to throw in emojis, but like, that's, that's where we're moving towards. I understand that. But like, in terms of like education, like we need to instill a proper English language. I think that has value and you're not gonna like rewrite all the things that people need to learn, all this like legal jargon and all that in in everybody's individual like language. Like again, take it away from like black Americans, like the New York Italians, like you're not gonna find legal theory written in like I don't want to say something rude, but like written in the way that, that they don't, that they speak, uh, that New York Italians speak, which is not proper to say it the nice way. Right. But so and again, I'm, I'm very much in agreement that we need a common language to be able to communicate effectively across like a, a wide variety of people. It's why I think like using Latin names for medical terms is actually a good idea. Right? It's not favoring anybody. We're all using this like quote unquote neutral language and it's neutral because it's dead. So that way, like someone in Japan and someone in uh, Bosnia and someone in Canada can all talk about the same body parts. I think that's generally good. But also there's a big criticism, a valid one, is that education is often sometimes behind where they need to be. Education is not telling you information. It's teaching you information which means you have to meet the learner halfway if your learners are not learning because your method of pedagogy is inferior or it's outdated you got to adapt to it like for for example a lot of people would consider it to be unprofessional for teachers uh to use slang to use like a vernacular of the of the area and in my opinion sometimes that can be unprofessional but sometimes it can be a way more effective means of conveying information to your students like i, I teach for a living and i really like using slang i like using internet slang i like making jokes i like pushing that line of what what is appropriate for uh for an instructor to maintain their professionalism because i've saw success with it people understand the material better and at the end of the day that's what i care about right and look i i'm fine like again i'm fine with with like innovating innovative teaching techniques one of the reasons why like i'm pretty supportive of school choice if you look at the way that they structure their curriculums and all that it's completely different in a lot of cases from what you would get in a standard public school so i'm fine with innovative teaching methods and all that but like the point I want to harp on and like one of the issues I have with critical race theory and one of the concerns I have with implementing it is that if we jump in with this idea that a common language or assimilation, even in the classroom, even if it even if it's like pretty obvious that this would give you an advantage in learning other subjects, because, again, all your textbooks are written in your standard American English, then we're setting black kids behind and theoretically the reason we're teaching critical race theory is to help non-white children like get educated better. Like if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, so like, I mean, even no, if even, the CRT is not the rejection of all those concepts is the questioning of them. And I think that's good. Like, I think it helps to speed up. Like, so I, in my teaching classes at the graduate level, uh, oh, fuck, has it been a year since I graduated? I'm so goddamn old. Um, when I was taught, like a lot of them, like, hey, this is a new thing. Like, we're trying to put the focus more on the student. We're trying to move away from like lectures. We're trying to move away from like what are considered traditional forms of learning, traditional forms of like language in order to better communicate with with more students as a whole. So it's not that you're rejecting uh, all at once, rejecting the idea of common language, even rejecting the idea of proper English. It's just recontextualizing. It's letting students know, like, this is the language that we have deemed neutral English, while also saying that, like, yeah, who gets to decide what is proper English? I think it's fair to look at like why are why are these sounds in this order objectively proper English? And the answer is well, they're really not. We use them for utility, and their utility is that that shared language. I I'm like I hate I hate to keep like like hitting on this point, but it's it's not that it was decided that this is like proper English. Like the majority of scholarship is written in this in this manner. So like. Even if it, it like, let's say, um, let's say for black students, like they get a 10% disadvantage from like not knowing this, like coming into school, like the, my, like my question, uh, fucking just bump up. My, I, I, I agree my, with my you question is, you're... my question is, as, as if we have a curriculum that's trying to cater to this, because we have this belief that it's a cultural genocide to get them to focus uh, or, or, or the new Jim Crow as Patricia Williams 
stated that it was to get them to like learn a standard English. And that 10% advantage compound a disadvantage compounds over time. Like we're setting these kids back. This is why, like for me, this needs to be like, this can't be taught in the school. It's like for this and specific all, point can't yeah, be all taught critical in race schools. theory is, is asking you to question the other end. If you're focused on the students, what the students need to do better, what how like the individual learners need to do better, that's fine and good. But you also have to look forward. Like you also have to look at the people who are doing the teaching, who are making the assumptions, who are deciding what is and is not appropriate to teach. This is not a rejection of either of those ideas. What CRT does that I think needs to be done is we're introducing this critique, this, you know, questioning of like what is considered appropriate, what is considered, uh, what is assumed to be correct. And it's just questioning that make you think a little bit deeper. Like yeah. those assumptions might come from places that I'm, aren't super valid if you think about them for a little bit this, longer. Th but this is like the part I have to disagree on. It's like, sure, like critical theory and it's like in its most basic form would be like we're we're trying to be critical of society and blah, blah, blah. And critical race theory, how how all these things interact. I, I get that. But like they do take affirmative stances. Like when you have scholars writing that it is a form of cultural genocide to try to standardize public education in this way, like that is an affirmative stance. Like that's a position. You don't call something the new Jim Crow or a modern day version of Jim Crow if you don't have a position on it. Okay, so I think this is, we are sort of talking in circles about the, the the language thing, but I think this can bring us to the next topic of like, what is CRT? What is, and I should say, what is CRT really in quotation marks? Are you okay with moving on to that? Well, I, I'm, I feel like I'm just going to say like the same things I've been saying. I, I understand, but like, I, I just want you to acknowledge that like Patricia Williams, when she calls something a modern form of Jim Crow, like that, that is her Mr. taking Williams next time. I'm just saying that is her taking a stance. Like you, you wouldn't disagree with that. I would no, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I also don't think taking a stance is necessarily bad. I, I'm not saying taking a stance is bad. I'm just saying like she is taking a stance and these stances are common in critical race theory writings. At least what I've read. If you have something that's, if you have something that's uh, like a counter essay from within the discipline, um, then I would be happy to read it. But like, there's yeah, this, this gets like to the next thing I wanted to talk about, right. and uh, it's uh, please correct me if I'm mischaracterizing your position. Uh, the only thing I very purposely and uh, only watched uh, the CRT debate you had with uh, Riley and and uh, Destiny. Right. If I'll snap a few like that helps you remember. You just snap harder. Um, is that one of the biggest critiques you had of it uh, uh, was its reliance on personal narratives? Is that correct? Well, this would be this would be the storytelling, and I believe they call it legal storytelling story. and nar narrative analysis. I believe they call it counter storytelling, like yeah. now. So sure. So can you? So again, just stop me if I'm mischaracterizing you. You say that this is a, an effort to like place anecdotes as representative of whole facts to draw your truth of the world from anecdotes rather than from quote objective reality. Is that somewhat close? Maybe uh, better I, if you if you relate. I would I would say that like. The idea of like counter storytelling or like countering the narratives is like you're you're inserting your lived experience and it's fine to tell stories about yourself. It's fine to like tell things that have personally happened to you that are that are bad, but you're like asserting that and then there's extrapolation off of that in place of data often. And this is like an issue that I have. And like so this is, in my opinion, a misinterpretation of what storytelling and counter storytelling mean. So uh and I'm going to bring this back. This is like probably like my biggest point of contention with your interpretation of CRT. So I'm sure you've experienced this. We're both content creators of roughly equal size. I'm exactly as, as big and important as you. Uh, but we've all, we've had this scenario where we're presenting the exact same, we're, we're presenting facts. And then someone else looks at those exact same facts and comes away with a wildly indifferent interpretation of them. A wildly different like analysis of the exact same numbers, the exact same studies. They come away thinking something incredibly different. This to me is what they mean by storytelling and counter storytelling. Like they opened the chapter about let's see what's the chapter called? Yeah, legal storytelling and narrative analysis. Legal storytelling and narrative analysis. There you go. They open that chapter by describing a lot of scenarios in which two people see the same thing and come away with wildly different opinions of what actually happened. So who gets to decide where the objective truth is? I think that's one of the biggest benefits of this. In fact, we're doing it right now. Like this debate, the form of the debate that we're having, and, the, and uh, to a, a certain extent what you had last time, this is a form of storytelling 
and counter storytelling. You're trying to propose like what CRT actually is, and I'm trying to propose what CRT actually is. Now, we haven't read the exact same uh, sources, I'm sure. We, I'm sure those differ a little bit, but I think our sources overlap enough to say that we're looking at really, really similar things, but we're coming away with wildly different interpretations of it. And in this case, like objective reality is objective reality is way different when you're talking about societal analysis law justice like abstract concepts like that versus in something like physics and even in physics most papers will say like this is our best guess as to what's happened based on the the tools that we have available right um so like sure we're like arguing and we're like looking at similar material and coming to different conclusions but and you keep saying legal storytelling and like, yeah, th this I'm, is another... I'm just being the name of the chapter. Right. Well, there's another thing that I've, I've noticed in conversations related to critical race theory is that there's a lot of leaning on like the legal writings, which are a little bit more grounded because you actually have to analyze, like, uh, analyze Jesus. You have to well, actually I'm not even going to try to interpret the legal stuff, but I'm, I'm saying I'm just you... reciting the name of the chapter. I'm just saying, so you have to give analyses of like cases, et cetera, et cetera. Like, one of the things that I highlighted is one of the um, it's like it's considered like a seminal book. If you look at the people who reviewed it, like you can dispute its importance. That's fine. It's it's called the rooster's egg. And there's a lot of essays in there that are not like two people looking at the same set of data and coming to different conclusions. There's extrapolations from like what are anecdotes like my favorite one. And I, I think I, I I'm going to just try to pull it from memory because I didn't pull up the notes is um a story about going to, uh, I think it was like a five and dime store. And a black in, doll that was. Yeah. And in this, in this one store, the black doll was on sale and Williams like extrapolates from that. It's, it's, she determined that it was like the same, basically the same doll as the white doll. Um, and she extrapolated based on that because there was like a, I believe there's a black clerk. And if I, if I'm wrong about this, like commenters, please like, freak out and like correct me on the most minute details it, it and she, for yeah, the purposes she, of this yeah this is true this so is she purpose. she extrapolated off of that that like capitalism devalues black people and like there's this isn't like this de devalues black people and it even forces black people to devalue black people like that is not an analysis of data that's one factoid that she saw once in a store that she could have just made up because like, who's going to go and check the literal five and dime store that she went to. Well, yeah, like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying she did make it up, but like, but you're probably like anticipating the response to that is like, well, why does this one anecdote that you read in one book representative of not only that book, but of critical race theory as a whole. So that would be like the counter argument to that. Well, like it's an example of a, of an anecdote. Like there are other things, like I highlighted a bunch of things from a paper. I can pull up, like, I think I might have a document somewhere, but like, I don't want to get into individual stories because then we end up, we end up, our, we end up getting into this trap where, let me Google like, a bad thing anti CRT while yeah, you Google. Well, yeah, I'm, no, I'm just saying. Then we end up getting into no, the that's why we're where, not doing it. Yeah. yeah, where an individual like individual scholars, even though they're foundational scholars, and I've yet to see the the refutations from within the discipline from people who argue that the discipline has changed from that view, are like called individuals, even if they're like the people that you come up with. Like, so like well, if, yeah, there's, if there's if there's a the, better here's, here's there's the refutation. Like, Sorry. If ahead. there's a better construction of uh, if there's a better construction of storytelling that I'm missing, I would love to see it. But from what I can see, it's like this idea that like the this objective way of looking at things is really catering toward the majority culture, and that minorities have a unique perspective that can't be judged by like outsiders, and you can't okay, like, question that lived this. experience. I think I can convince you on this. So both of us, we're trying to figure out what CRT actually is, because if you're going to, I mean, I think it's fair, like if you're talking about whether or not something should be in schools, we should know what that thing is. And both of us are using storytelling and counter storytelling based on really, really, at least similar overlapping sources to say what CRT is really. So we're trying to point to the objective truth of what crt is because that's the analysis that's the interpretation that's going to be used for like legal uh 
uh, like legal purposes, like to outlaw things. However, one of the things that I really, really like about this, about CRT, is that they reject that there is an objective truth of what CRT is. Like there's no one encapsulating sentence. It's going to be a lot of uh, like internal critiques. I think, again, I th see that as a benefit. A lot of CRT tenets have a lot of debate within them. So there's never going to be one thing that CRT is. Now, I recognize that could be really, really frustrating. Uh, to a lot of people like, well, you know, that's not real CRT. It can definitely be used in a bad faith matter to say like, that's not real CRT. That's not real CRT. But I think there's merit in like you, uh, you put forth that, that anecdote from that story. That could be, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that that is true. Well, and if that, and if the way you, in, uh, anal if the way you described it was they were extrapolating with no extra data added anywhere that this is indicative and representative of a problem. Yeah, I definitely disagree with that. Well, However, in the interpretation that I had, it was about like, how do we, how do we have people coming together to look at the same facts, the same events in history even, and how are they coming away with vastly different like in interpretations of them? Because, I'll, you know, the way a history works objectively ironically enough is that we take certain events we include what we think is important and we exclude what we think is not important that's there's just really no other way to do history even if you list dates unless you're gonna list every single date that ever existed and so I'm, there is a form of like what is true there what ought I, to be taught what is the neutral pathway and what's neutral is often determined by people who think they're neutral but not so like this is this is like this is the issue i it's almost it's almost verbatim that I run into any, any time I discuss this is you end up getting into a thing where it's like, well, like that's not like the true CRT. It's almost a variant on the no true Scotsman thing. And I get like, they're, they're very abstract and to CRT's credit, like they do say that they're like, they're activists in nature and they're looking for a better society. And to my knowledge, they have not found the better society and they don't pretend that they've like they know what the end point is themselves. Like maybe sure. at some point that end game will be outlined. But like, if if we're talking about like whether or not we're gonna implement something into the schools and there's like, anytime you look up critical race theory, you get like a list of like components, right? And like, mm -hmm. let's say there's six of them. And one of the six is storytelling. One of the, one of the six is like living authentically racial, which contained within that is the cultural genocide thing. Like at what point do at what point if you're if you agree with me on certain aspects of like removing certain parts of that, are we like not talking about teaching critical race theory anymore? So like if the we analogy remove, I would use is like science. Do we want science taught in schools? Sure. Definitely. Are there instances of science being taught very poorly in schools? And we want that to stop. Yep. So I would like to, so I know that I know this is frustrating. It's frustrating on the other end too. Uh, let's, I'm going to list the tenets from that book and let's, let's go through them uh, one by one, starting in reverse order uh, <clears throat> and see like what you would disagree with. And if there is a good interpretation of that, that would be valuable in schools. All right. So number six, so this is the basic tenets of CRT from chapter one of the Delgado book coexisting in somewhat uneasy tension with anti-essentialism. So this is in reference to a previous tenant. So going in reverse order may not be the best idea. The voice of color thesis holds that because of their different histories and experiences with oppression, uh, BIPOC writers and thinkers may be able to communicate to their white counterparts uh, matters that the whites are unlikely to know. And that has more, that ha you know, obviously they're, they're going to have anecdotes. They're going to have experiences that white people just haven't had on account of being white, but also it ha uh, has a different interpretation, what they deem important. Like for example, if we're talking about historical atrocities, who do we want to trust? Who is the better perspective on what happened in those atrocities? Do we recount like the uh, like events from the perspective of the people who committed them? Do we recount them on the, the legal fallout that happened? Do we uh, recount like the biggest newspapers? Uh, or do we go in and we find like, what are the people who are being affected in, do we emphasize their story more than the others because that was the firsthand experience that a lot of people just didn't understand like none of those are correct but i think having that perspective of the same events like same events same data points same things what happened having that different interpretation that is often lacking because of like big man history i think is very very valuable okay so, um so yeah, like if we were to take an example like the Armenian genocide, like we probably wouldn't trust the Turks that greatly underestimate it from what our experts would say. Like they they ballpark it at like 300,000 people that died. Um, most historians would say about 1.5 million. But there's like, there's a reason they lean more towards, like they lean towards the higher number than the lower number there. It's because like 
Armenian population pre and post, like you have remains of people, like how big this like Turkish anti-Armenian program was. So there's like hard data to back to the best of our knowledge, what we actually teach. Well, and like, but and like is teaching but, only data, only dates, but, but like giving you a good view of history. Well, well, like, so like hearing from the perspective, so like I went to a university and they built like a Holocaust center, like mm -hmm. hearing from the perspective of, of a Holocaust survivor, like firsthand, like, I do think there is value in that. But if I talk to this, if this survivor told me that there was 85 million Jewish people there, like that, it felt like there were that many there, like, I would obviously know that's wrong. So like, while her personal experience there, like, is matters right and like i think it's important one of the biggest tragedies going forward on the internet is that a lot of these people are no longer to be going to be with us so like all these like little denial lists and all that are not going to be able to like they they, they you're not going to get that situation where no, you have think, to actually deny missing, deny it to I, a survivor but I i'm saying missing the, uh, so the purpose of like what i was trying to say it's not we're getting away from numbers all right is it if we only look at numbers are we getting an accurate view of history? Like, can you conceptualize a million dead people in your head? That's really tough to do. A lot of people, to a lot of people, hearing that a million people died in this genocide, that's just a number. It doesn't have the weight that it ought to. Versus, if you hear like one detailed accounted story of how someone like lived, how they were, how they suffered, if you hear one detailed account of that, that could change your perspective in a way that is we would consider more accurate than just hearing the numbers alone. So I'm not saying that we should like listen to different perspectives on empirical data, although there's some legitimacy to that in some aspects. I'm saying that when we're trying to get a more complete view of society, numbers just aren't enough. Numbers are numbers without like without context. But numbers don't mean anything. I I. I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with you because if you get like, so like I have, I have experience with mental illness in my, in, in my family. Right. And I have horror stories about like the mental health care system in Florida. Right. Like really bad stuff. I'm not going to share it on air. Now, Florida happens to be objectively ranked like the 49th worst state for mental health care. Right. So like maybe like my, like the personal stories of the relative I'm thinking of, the fact that he lived in Florida when a lot of these occurred are in line with the objective data. But like he also lived a long time in New York and he had a lot of problems with the healthcare system here in New York and New York is ranked higher. So like if the stories that I had to tell were worse in New York than they were in Florida, then that story could give you the misperception that New York New York's mental health care is worse than Florida when objectively by the numbers and by patient outcomes, we know that it's not so like sure there's like value in like hearing from people and i think that's important to a certain extent but to the point that it subordinates the data i'm not in favor of it like but you could also get the the mistaken impression that let's say we have the state that is the best in mental health care scores objectively the best in mental health care and you hear a story coming out of the place like i had a horrible experience with multiple different psychiatrists multiple multiple different institutions that's not giving you an inaccurate uh, description of like the whole it's telling you not everybody made it through the cracks and i think that's worth including all right yeah but, well the sure the, i'm I, not saying that there's not a system without problems but i think we run into a lot of this and to bring it back to the racial thing uh, we run into a lot of this with interactions with the criminal justice system. So like there's a belief and like they've studied this, that that um, among among black people, that when they get pulled over by the cops, they're being targeted racially. Right. Mm -hmm. So like we do experiments based on this. And one of the most famous ones is the New Jersey traffic experiment where they like try to capture as much data about who was actually driving on the road versus. Oh, my God. I keep bumping this mic versus who was speeding who is more likely to speed and who is more likely to violate the speed limit in like greater amounts. And what they found was, is that black people were under targeted. Now, if you asked, let's say, like, if you asked like all those drivers why they were pulled over and 40% of them said that I think race was a factor in me being pulled over, like, that's how they feel. That's their lived experience. And that's like their reaction to it. But it's not in line with the data of that experiment. Yeah, but we also have the opposite problem, like the bigger study. And I know you brought that study as a counter to like the national traffic stop study with like millions. So there are points in favor of that study and there are weaknesses. The weakness is it's New Jersey. It's one place. It's not going to be representative of the, of the United States. Sure. But a benefit of having a smaller sample uh, a smaller sample size is that you can introduce more variables more consistently versus like the big one where they say, okay, 
black drivers are more often pulled over in the daytime versus in the nighttime, right. the dis uh, disparities uh, go away. Now, this is where you well, run well, into trouble. Hold on, like, hold, on, hold, on you... hold on, hold on. So there's a disparity between day and night. It's about 5 to 10%. Like, mm -hmm. I've heard 15, but I, I think it's about 5 to 10%. But the issue... Sure. The issue I have with that with that is like you can look at the data sets, right? And like mm -hmm. this is one of the things that I do because I have too much time on my hand. And it's like an Excel spreadsheet of traffic stops. Not contained within that is the makeup of drivers on the road because this wasn't collected for the purpose of studying something like the New Jersey traffic study. Not saying it has no value, but they just collected normal traffic stop data across the country, which is why they got 100 million stops. And it's interesting. And there is a gap, but like, we don't have a good measure of what is driving that gap. We can make assumptions based on that. And like, I think that they're faulty when you don't have to make up people on the road. Cause we know black and white people overall have differences in habits and they might be out at different times of day, et cetera, et cetera. And that could explain much of, if not all the gaps. Here's a really good. Uh, so here's a really good thing. A lot of, so I've done a lot of research on system justification theory and a lot of people, good people who are not, uh, what we typically call racist want to reject claims of racism because it helps them maintain like a good feeling about the world that they live in. All right. So a lot of people will like, I know you call it like what the racism of the gaps or something like that. A lot of people, anytime they, and I personal anecdote, that means it's uh, irrefutable. A lot of people will say that anytime a, a study shows, uh, comes up showing like racial disparities, like black people aren't hired as much as white people or black people are more likely to be pulled over, you know, black and white people are committed for the same crime. They'll all, they'll never say that racism can be a factor. They'll point to things that might be the factor as like preferable. And it's not based on data that they have of the perceived data that they're missing that might be more explanatory. And I know that that can be good. I do that all the time in studies, like what variables, what obvious variables were you missing? But also, it leaves uh, the important like question, how do you measure racism? How do you measure bigotry? And that's where we, you got to get into the subjective. You got to get into personal narratives. You got to get into interpretations. I, I, I think one of the, one of the issues I have, and I'm not saying I'm looking for like, I, I am looking for like alternative explanations because I think that's what you're supposed to do when you examine the data, but I'm not looking for it to disprove the notion of racism. Like if my feeling is, is if I disprove, the alternatives, then I can better under, then I can better align with people who are claiming that it's racism. So like a perfect example of this, and it comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, was the General Motors lawsuit, which is like one of the first major applications of intersectional theory. So General Motors employed plenty of black people. Uh, they just employed them in the manufacturing uh, wing of the company, and they employed plenty of women, and they employed them in clerical work. Now, they didn't employ... I think almost any, if not like maybe like way less than they were getting applicants for black women. So like when they sued for discrimination, General Motors is like, well, we have black people over here and we have women over here. There's no discrimination. And this is like the idea that like it's because you're being discriminated against because you're black and a woman, then that not just the individual. Now, I actually might disagree with the overall framing of like the intersectional argument, because I think the same like racist ideas that you would hire a black person for manual labor could apply to why you would not hire a black person for more written work. Like if you don't, if you have that in your head that they could do manual labor, but not written work, this could actually explain the disparity. But point being like, that is a gap. They exhausted the other options and they ended up ruling against General Motors in that case. And like, I agree with that, but I think you have to do the work to exhaust those other options. No, and I agree in the best possible case case scenario, you should exhaust all the other options you should have. If we had infinite amounts of data, we should look at every single variable to find the one that is most true. The difficulty is that oftentimes that's not possible to do. And a lot of the, what we come through is like, so if we have a disparity of outcomes, if we have a, a disparity in equity, we'll say, well, that's not proof of racism because, you know, racism is about ensuring equal opportunity and not equal outcomes. So you can't look at outcomes to prove racism. OK, so what about intent? How do you measure intent? If someone is not explicitly like upfront about their, their racist intent, well, how can you prove that that intent was racism? This stuff is hard. It's very challenging. There are a lot of variables that can't be measured un until we know how to like stick a, a USB port. Uh, in your brain, which we won't have for another like three or four years. And so 
a lot of it is based on assumptions, but a lot of it, that's where the personal narratives come from. Like, and, and that's why that they're valuable. There might be things that we're missing. There might be things that data that numbers aren't able to catch. And I am a big data guy. I love empiricism. One of my last videos had 70 fucking sources in it. All right. I love my empiricism, but I'm saying there's a lot of stuff that that misses. And in some of those cases, it's useful to have those personal accounts, especially if you gather qualitative data. I've been like red pilled. I don't know what the kid, what the kids are saying. I have like really come into terms of like how valuable qualitative data is because it puts into it is so it's really really useful interpreting quantitative data in a way that's far more useful than using just numbers alone. Again, this is not an anti numbers or anti science stance. It's saying let's offer some more perspectives into where this might be coming from. Uh, and you'll see and you'll see a lot of in the other direction. A lot of white people. In fact, the numbers that I saw last, and I don't know if these are super representative, but the numbers I saw last says that white people think that anti white discrimination is more of a problem than anti black discrimination. So that's interesting to look at. Why is that? That we can call well, that an objective fact uh, that they feel that way, and it's useful. Well, to look, right? I, I I don't think it's an objective fact. If you're, it's an objective like, fact that those are the numbers. Well, I'm saying uh, that. Oh yeah, sure. Like the polling is uh, like that's how they feel, but like that's because like it is broadly tolerated to be anti-white in the United States of America. Like, what's, what's the perspectives? Like, what does it mean to be anti-white like, in pop culture and all that? Like, you know, you get some really quite like. There's some people like so there's that academic definition of racism where racism is like structural and it's based on like systemic power and all that. There's some people who take that and they decide that they're going to be like really, really anti white person in their speech and be like, oh, but I'm not racist because this is the new definition that I'm working on. So, like, I understand why they feel like why they feel about that. I mean, yeah, but you how have, you, you have people but, openly saying this, diversity you know, means. You have old people openly saying diversity does mean less white people. Like I think I mean, that was like, wait, like, isn't that just mathematically true? Yeah, no, not necessarily. I mean, there's, <laughs> like, well, I mean, it, if you're talking about like ethnic diversity, like there's plenty of that within like white people. Well, like, this is see, I think this is worth examining. Like, and if, if what we're talking, mean, if you're talking about like, you know, when we're trying to prove anti-white race, racism. You can point to like anecdotes. You can point to like these situations where like someone said, uh, "White people can't do this. White people are are bad." You don't have to point to harms. You don't have well, to prove I'm empirically that white people are suffering harms. But when you're talking about racism against people of color or other or other minority groups, now all of a sudden those anecdotes aren't enough. Those feelings aren't enough. Now we need empirical data showing definitively that race was the determinant factor in the disparity of uh, the disparities of outcomes that we're uh, witnessing. And well, that and that's what CRT looks at. Why are these assumptions baked in? Well, so, I, I would just to finish the point I was making, like in Japan, like having less white people wouldn't make Japan more diverse. They're like 90 whatever percent ethnically Japanese. It's, it's like context is important. Yeah. That's, so I'm just saying like inherently those are not like actually in line. Well, obviously but, we're putting like diversity in the context I, of America. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying so. And like I'm not I'm not saying so. I'm not saying that white people are being like harmed in like harmed the most objectively by like any kind of systemic like racism or anything like that. I think the data kind of shows that like Asians are being harmed honestly by, by uh, affirmative action policies more than, more than any other group. And actually black people are being harmed by affirmative action because a lot of times you have people that should be like, everybody's kind of moved up a class. If, if, uh, how, how do I explain? Okay, so when when I was a kid, I was in Little League, and in Little League, they we had like a, a eight and nine, like like team, and then the next one up is like the ten and eleven team, and we had some kids that were like on the nine, so they were going to become ten and all that, and there was a decision made to either keep the team together and promote, split the team, or hold everyone back. So we got bumped up to the next one, and all, our team got destroyed the next year. And it's because even though like we had good players, they weren't ready to make the next jump. So one of the things that like happens and people don't acknowledge this with affirmative action is that black kids get into better universities for sure through this program, but they drop out a lot from those elite universities. And would you have been better off if you didn't go to an Ivy League school and drop out versus if you went to a school like just below the Ivy League and you actually graduated? And I think that's like 
to me, so it's one, objectively. I just want to point out, look at the power of storytelling. Use a personal anecdote to like make your point. That's the power of storytelling. Well, I was, I'm trying to use, there's, I'm trying to use an analogy to like, ex, like explain what I mean. Like, yeah, but there's it's also, not, like, it's not that I, I saw this exact, I saw this exact point. Uh, like, so there's a chapter that addresses criticism in that, in that CRT book, the Delgado book. And they say that, well, that, that, that exact scenario that maybe black kids would be better off not going to the better schools. One, like, that's kind of shitty, isn't it? Like, you think black people can't make it in higher schools? That no, no, like that. that's, that's the emo that's the emotional argument. Okay, but they also say that. Well, no, the data kind of suggests that black people do pretty good. A lot of most of them graduate. Most of them have favorable experiences. They're, they're doing pretty okay. Their rates might not be quite as high as other groups in terms of graduating. Their GPA is not uh, may not quite be as high. But why ought those quantitative measures be more indicative? Be be more diagnostic of the effectiveness of, of a college education? I'm sure you 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 have plenty of like stories of like uh, employers getting a kid with a 4.0 GPA in college being the worst fucking employee in the world and then a kid with a 3.1 GPA being the best employee in the world. Maybe those quantitative measures, even though that might be the best approximation that we have, because we do, I like quantitative data too. They're not the whole story. We have to have this qualitative uh, subjective analysis, right? So, so look, I'm not saying that like black kids graduating high school that like can't like make it in, a, in the Ivy league. Like obviously like there are kids that are like, yeah, to don't go back take to, that seriously. That was, yeah, that was to, but I'm saying right. to go back to like my baseball analogy, like there were kids that did better when we went to the next, when we went to the next jump. So like there are, yeah, sure. There's some people being gained, but there's also like higher dropout rates. And I can't like, you know, I can't say this for sure, but I think one of the reasons why based on the data that I've seen is that these kids end up being the, like among the worst in their class because they were elevated to get there rather than the best in the class at the previous university that had they graduated that university would have been more valuable to them than actually dropping out of an Ivy League school with student loan debt. I think there's or an like assumption a higher here. Rank there might be an debt. assumption here that you don't realize that you're ma uh, making. Being the worst in your class at a very, very good school might be more beneficial to you. It might give you a better education than but, being the best of your class but at a kind of shitty school. Not, not, right? not if it not if it causes not if it's the reason that you drop out. Like if you're if you're more pressured and all that. Like if you don't graduate. Like obviously if you if look if you if you push through it and you make it through to the other side, you'll probably be all right. Like one of the one of the more interesting like Harvard Law stories, if you hear from people who've like been accepted, is that they tell you like when you make it there on orientation, like you've made it. The race is over. Like this is look at the Supreme Court, look at the presidents. This is where people who get through this program goes. The competition is over, right? So hundred percent, I understand that some of these schools just getting in are a high bar. And Harvard, like if you try but, to drop but, out, but then, but then also being the worst, consistently one of the worst people yeah. in your class, you might still be getting the best education possible. So right, well, why? And, and like the Harvard matters and all that, but like your first year at law school, like determines where you're going to work. Cause that determines what job you get in the off in like the off and all that. But like, if you don't finish like the school and you end up loaded up with more debt than you would have normally taken on, like I'm a big believer, like, uh, like in New York, we have the system called the CUNY system. The CUNY system has put more people in the middle class than the Ivy league. Like, you know, it was called, it used to be called like the poor man's Ivy league because like oh, yeah. solid don't, schools. don't think that i'm simping for like ivy league schools like, i think like i want the what? quality of education in worse schools community colleges i think there's a lot of value that we're missing there but my my, my my issue is is like if we want the outcome of more black people getting into harvard or more black people getting into cornell what, whatever school right and we want it bad enough that we're pushing kids that would have done better in like that like next tier of university and actually graduated and went on to have successful careers. And maybe they make enough money that they get the SAT prep for their kids and their kids get into Harvard or whatever, right? If if we're pushing them into the next into like the next league and then they end up dropping out, they're worse off because of that intervention that we try to do because we wanted a certain outcome. And not to mention the kids that should get in, which are mostly Asian, by the way. Like a lot of people don't realize that they, they've had like economists, even in these affirmative action lawsuit cases that have broken it down. And they're like, affirmative action is actually kind of like it disadvantages white people a little bit. It's kind of neutral. The people who really get hit are the Asians. So like we're keeping them out of the schools for people who have so, a but greater likelihood. So you know, this was a out. huge, like a critical race theory will like point to you like, why are you trying like a lot of people will say that because asians do so well because jews do so well there can't be anti-minority discrimination in america because we have examples of minorities doing well but that's like 
point to like a black white binary like we have white people and we have non-white people all the non-white people are homogenous we have to look at them the same way and if one group's doing well that means all of them have to be doing well but we can't use discrimination to just, uh, to determine like why other people are doing well there's a different history there of both like a jewish people and of, uh, like asian people there's a different history there that makes them it's just flat out incorrect to paint them as analogous uh as like their minority status is the same as the minority no, status of a person like so a, of a I, black person or a Hispanic I person. but but i didn't say that i didn't say that i know i'm just like because, there's that's because, that's a common because assumption on the i didn't say that because asians do well therefore there's there's no racism in fact i'm actually saying that because asians do so well that there's like active ways to keep them out of universities like california they got rid of a affirmative action either through ballot initiative or through the courts and like the people who filled up the the CSU system or or whatever they call it in there. But what uh, if those like uh, were, were eight, like what about those like uh, the people who suffered under CRT or uh, suffered under affirmative action? Why don't they go to the, one of those schools that would have been great for the for the other kids? I mean, I mean, I would I would want them to go to schools that like are better aligned with them. Like I would want so, like I would look I want people to shoot for the stars hundred percent right. And like, obviously, like Barack Obama is clearly helped out by the fact that I think he went to Columbia Law. It's one of the most prestigious like law schools. You of know, course, I, all of us want, I think yeah. most of it, if we take everybody but, in good faith, all of us want everybody to do as well as possible. But the issue becomes like, no, people aren't starting from the same place. And a lot of people like uh, this, the, the liberalism argument, a lot of people, as long as we don't put barriers in your way. Uh, overt barriers that can be easily skirted around if you know how to phrase your words correctly. As long as those aren't in the way, everybody's got an equal shot. Where CRT is looking at like, whoa, this no. is ridiculous. People are starting from vastly different parts in their lives, vastly different material, like like material possessions and material wealth, and that's un uh, that's objectively influencing how, how people, what the likelihood of people who are going to succeed and being colorblind pretending that racism is over this isn't going to go away to address that i am so sorry can i pee and get a drink of water oh uh, sure do you think how about would you, uh, like, would, would you like to respond about, to me first so, so oh sure just piss, um piss off so, me yeah so uh and we'll take like five after this because you know got to make the i've got the same biological needs um so I, I i took i took this class from a professor who was like written in favor of affirmative action. His name is Professor Stroop. Like you can read up on this. And he's actually way more hardcore in favor of affirmative action. He's like, if there was past discrimination and you're trying to remedy it, just fire the white people that you have and hire black people. Like that's like, he's like, do it in a year. Right. And one of the things that he got me off of is like this equal opportunity kick. Like there's no equal, equal opportunity. Like, I think as a society, we should work towards increasing the amount of opportunity in our society. But the reason you don't have equal opportunity is because when you're a baby, you're not taken to a government warehouse and given like the exact same diet, the exact same everything. So like, that's not like, that's, that's not reality. And to the extent that critical race theory acknowledges that that's not reality, I'm fine with that. But like, do the question is, is that how do we deal with the fact that like, people leave stuff to their kids like that's natural it's part of humanity like you want to take care of their next generation do we try to harm our current generations because of some past generation trauma or you know in like a quest for like cosmic justice or do we acknowledge that that harm happened and decide not to like lay the sins of the father down on the children and just try to increase the better, uh, increase opportunity overall in response. Acknowledging that people- My biggest response to that is it's happening whether you want it to or not. The sins of the father, it's happening to the people who are harmed, whether we want it to or not. And so it's really, it comes from a place of like, I'm gonna say the word privilege to say that, well, I shouldn't have to suffer from the what my ancestors did. When guess what? Other people are suffering because of what their ancestors went through and what your ancestors did. All right. There's not, there's when we have to like punish white people now, like we have to like explicitly punish them, but it's also kind of rich to say that, no, like what happened, like who your parents were shouldn't matter who, what you, you know, what struggles that your people went through or what harms you committed in the past, that shouldn't matter. All right. You're an individual. That's great. When you haven't suffered because of it. And I think that it's just, that comes from a place of like, man, it's, I'm sure am happy that I get to think that way. So, I mean, look, uh, I, I'll, I'll break there because if I do a response, then you're going to respond and all that. But like, we'll put a pin in that. We're going to take five. I just and, peed a little. 
Oh, okay. Because I, I responded. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll take five, and then we'll come back. So I'll bring uh, you all. I'll bring you off the stream, and then I'll come back. Okay. Uh, okay. So remove. All right. Um, it's it's an interesting discussion. Um, I'm not going to talk too much while. Oh, I think he just turned off his camera. I'm not going to talk too much while he's not here uh, because I do have to use the bathroom too. So, um, but yeah. Uh, also, if you're sending super chats, I will read them at the end of this. But I do have to use the bathroom too. So, let me go like this. And mute, yeah. Yeah, all righty. <clears throat> How are we doing, Chet? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I wasn't expecting like any sort of like hardcore spice or, <clears throat> or what's it called? A uh, blood sports from Sean. So I, I do much prefer having like conversations like this. What I've learned is like civil conversations don't have to be like conciliatory. Like you can go back and forth. Like good conversations are are less are not about tone. That's something I've really like. You can be calm and be like a bad faith piece of shit. Like that's not indicative of, of good faith conversation. It's like, are you taking what the other person says charitably in order to attack the strongest version of that? I think that's way more useful. And even if it like even if you get, get a little bit heated, as long as it doesn't like devolve into anything. But I don't I don't have a ton of interest in doing that anyway. So I'm gonna have to ask him. Like, I can do about like thirty-ish more minutes. Oh, I wonder if everyone can see and hear me on his end. It says everyone can see and hear you. So, hi everyone. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, I'm back up. Just so you know, you were up. So. Like yeah, for the chat. I, I noticed that when it, where it says like, I wonder if everyone can see and hear me while looking at the box that says everyone can see and hear you. It's a conundrum. Yeah, I, I so what I you call it? Out. I, I figured like if you would get back before I did, like you know, then like you shouldn't like be blanked out, <laughs> um, because it was just gonna be my rabbit like head thing. So to the point about um, it's it, obviously like your past 
your your past generations influence your future like um and yeah like it would be advantageous for me personally to be like well my parent like my 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 parents never owned a home uh i didn't grow up wealthy like my mother's mother was like a drug addict and like you know her father died when she was like 13 and like she grew up in like the like in the projects therefore like i don't have the generational wealth and like we should do something to compensate for those past decisions but like my view of it and like something i try to do personally is like i want to make like i want to make better choices than my parents so like i don't want to i don't want if i have children to grow up in a single parent household which is why i'm very much like even before like i don't live with my girlfriend who you've met i i want to move in with her after we get married because i want to do better than like my parents did and like if we're trying to craft policy like we should create more opportunity for people that grow up in single parent households for people who don't you know who like my my grandma lived in a house but the reason she lived in a house is because when she was able to get that house with the person she was seeing at the time it was like right by right right by the airport it was over in Jackson Heights it's terrible right and like the reason you were able to buy property for really cheap in Jackson Heights was because the airport like you know planes used to be way louder so nobody wanted to live there so like th yeah there's a lot of people that grow up in differing circumstances and all that and i've met them i've met them all i've met the rich kids that own brownstones in in like manhattan like what their parents did when when they were born was they bought a brownstone that cost 2 million dollars then it's 10 million dollars now like what my parents did was like kind of scramble together and get married like to try to do something and then they of end course, up divorcing. Of so like we talk so, about policy. Okay, you're getting there. Sorry. My 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 point is is like, yeah, obviously we are influenced by our parents, which is but like the idea that we're going to get to equal opportunity, it's just it's just a farce. Like it sounds really good, but it's just not the case. So like Do you think that anybody, any critical race theorist, like the goal we will know everything has succeeded when literally every single person has a literally equal outcome in literally all areas. Well, I'm not, I'm not talking about outcome. I'm talking about opportunity. So, like my my position would have like or tried to what I've tried to advocate for is just increasing overall like opportunity. Like I think we should have better educational options. There's a lot of people in black areas. It's one of the things that I think the Republican Party is just probably the most brain dead on, like humanly possible, is that you have people lining up for lotteries to get out of the public schools and get into these charter schools. And like that is typically a Republican policy and you can't get any of those people for the most part, according to statistics to come and vote for you so that they can have more school. So I like well, want yeah, people to have better education. I, I, so I, and but I guess here's a, a big problem that I'm, I can't wrap my head around this. What about the people who don't win that lottery? That, what about the people who no? what about the people who don't get into the better school? Wouldn't it make way more sense on every level? to just make the schools better so all students have access to a better education, not just lucky ones who drew the correct number? Is our solution to addressing gaps, well, I, you got to work hard to be really lucky to like roll the dice correctly or pick the right, or however the lottery works for that? Right. Like, well, why wouldn't we just improve schools for everyone? So, like, yeah, like we've been trying that for a long time, but like, uh, like how, how much... How, how long are we going to funnel money into a, a bad system before we try to provide alternatives? I think that you should have more schools to meet the demands of parents. And it's it's not only like the kids that get into the schools, if you have more of them that do better, it's kids that are left behind. There's like less, there's a bunch of data that shows uh, less student to teacher, like lower, um, a lower student to teacher ratio will improve outcomes. So Which is even great, less, but then why not just make more schools that are publicly funded? Because, well, how many more schools are you going to make in a failing system? If you haven't shown me the ability to it, to develop the schools that you have, and we keep funneling more money into those schools. We could have an entire conversation about the edu educational system in and of itself. So can we, like, finish the last points and then... Yeah, I, 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 was, I was just saying, so, like, like I'm... I, I'm in favor of increasing overall opportunity, but this idea that you're going to remedy the past in some form of like, co like you're going to fix problems for people who are basically almost all long dead in order to make up for a better future. It's just not like it's, I don't think that's a rational policy. And I think it's a rational policy to look at like 
not just where are people now, but why are they there? Like what led to this, like understanding the circumstances that individual people might have. And within that, like there's a, there's a pull between like how homogenous do you view groups of people to make broad policies versus how individual do you like look to make sure that we're not treating everybody of a group the same. Like there's there's push and pull there, but I think that it's very, very useful to understand why certain people are poor, why certain people are in bad situations. Like I don't know of a policy that it, that I would support where the, the, the policy is just – just act better. Make better choices. No, that's not how policies work. We want to actually put people in a position where they're more likely to make better choices, where better choices are available. So I'll, so you obviously know way more about criminal theories than I do. But I forgot, was, uh, was it rational choice theory or something close to that? Where if your options as a 17-year-old kid in, in the uh, you know, inner city, if your options are maybe, possibly, getting a minimum wage job at McDonald's, and making basically enough money to, well, that silence was my was the uh, implication there, or selling drugs. It's almost objectively the correct answer to do the one that's going to make you a lot more money, increase your material means, make it way more likely that you're going to be able to succeed and not be hungry and, pro and provide for the people who are next to you, like. That's the rational choice in that scenario. You're like honor and law be damned. And on top of that is if you are in a system that has shown that it really doesn't give a fuck about you, you're more likely to like reject the laws of that system, to reject the norms of that system wholeheartedly. So addressing those systemic concerns, those material concerns at that level kind of helps uh, not solves, but it helps both of those problems. It shows that the system is there to try to help help you like the system is on your side and it also alleviates the material concerns that might cause someone to rationally choose to commit a crime or to do something that is harmful in the long term because people choose what is short term like beneficial over the long term all the time because that's how like our bodies interpret homeostasis short term is more important than long term i mean I, I, I don't think it's rationally the better choice. Like you get a job, you build up experience, you prove that you could show up to work on time, you could move on to another type of job. Like, and like the idea that people are, the, the idea that there's a huge swath of Americans living off of minimum wage, is, it's just not true. You look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the majority of people that are working minimum wage, or at least a significant plurality, are people who are not the sole income in their household. And if you look at the majority of people in poverty, most of them just don't work or work part time. So like, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree. That's where narratives that people, come from. I don't like, necessarily you can look at those. You can look at that broad data, but that doesn't paint a picture of any individual area. So this is an anecdote, but this is where personal narratives are true. Those statistics don't matter to the people I grew up with in Eastern Kentucky because they weren't true. They weren't representative of the environment I grew up in. The only jobs you had, especially if you only had a high school education, were working at the KFC Taco Bell or working at the uh, the convenience store or working at the gas station. Those are the only jobs available. And really, unless you knew somebody, you weren't getting those jobs because there's like four businesses in the entire town. And so like in those – like that area, you can't use a – global lens to view it you can't use those global national statistics to make an accurate diagnosis of what's going to help that area the most and same deal we can't say that okay people in east kentucky people in appalachia they're poor people in the inner city are poor well they're both poor we need to treat them the same no there's different circumstances that you need to take into account there so i like i do love my data but taking those those statistics they don't paint an accurate story for individual communities or even individual people i mean i look if you're yeah, there's there's differences in rural poverty and all that, but like I'm honestly like I hate to I hate to say I'm unsympathetic, but I'm not super sympathetic when we live in a country where 20% of our entire population used to move from like one decade to another to people who don't move out of their like failing towns. Like sometimes you got to go in order to find a job. Like you just move. Like, That's the mean. People right? people but people do need to move. Like there's this move where with what there's, there's an expectation that oh no there, move where with what you get if you have a car you get in your car and you move if you have like, a car what if you don't what because cars I, are expensive right all right the well, house is really, free not really people in people in poverty in this country tend to have be 1.5 cars meaning that a huge chunk of them have two cars by american poverty standards yeah does the car run i have a car out there i'm really honestly terrified of driving four hours tomorrow in it i don't know if it'll make it i mean like, again you're having like, a car it 
So like again, you're I like it, again, I I'm first of all, like I, I reject the notion that like poor people are, are Aladdin and they're like stealing because like they need to feed their family as like as like the primary like thing. I, I reject, reject the notion, the notion that, that they steal because they just don't know better or they're like I intrinsically I, ignorant. I, I reject the notion that like most people can't move. Like it's literally impossible. Sure. There's I reject downsides. the notion that it's going to be the solution that everyone can do. Sure, sure. There's downsides to it, but like, yeah, you can. No, one you can of the move. downsides is if you want to move to a place with jobs, the areas are going to be way more expensive. And so like you, it's like this catch 22. You don't have the money to move to a place with jobs. So you can't afford to live in a place with jobs. It's just catch 22. Like this I mean, is true for a lot of people. And I'll I mean, say, and, and this, and this is, I don't have to like point to data. Like there are scenarios where that is true. And it's not, it is a laughably simplistic policy. To, when you say people should just make better choices, well, no, no, I'm, this is like a sh conversation like Ender, because cool, well, we've solved all problems. Well, Why first are we having all, a discussion? First of all, people should make better choices. Like, but, but separate from that, like, again, there are people with, there are people who can move for better circumstances. It, this isn't like, this isn't me just asserting this. Like you can look up like polling data on people are way less likely to move for a job than they used to be. And like moving to a different location in order to get a better income, like it used to be more standard and it's a component of upward mobility. Like there is an attitude that is festering in, in the United States. And it festers a lot in, in terms of white communities especially rural communities near like a dead mining town or a manufacturing town. Is this going to be that like the, a, are you that the down player gener generation? Are that you going to disparage the, millennials? That the, no, I'm not even saying it's millennials, but it's that the jobs are, that the jobs need to come to them. And that's just not how it works. Like this isn't, this isn't I 19, think, this isn't so 1970. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. It's not 1970. Do you think that those, like you're all, uh, there's well, no alternative explanations. No, no. What if the jobs, like, what if the jobs aren't worth moving to anymore? Like, why are you like, so we're assuming there's a big assumption baked into that is that like people aren't moving as much as they used to. The big assumption there is that scenario, like material conditions, the economy, circumstances are the same then as it, as they are now. And what you seem to be pointing to is there's something different with the people today. And another explanation is, no, there's something different with the circumstances today. And people are just making the best choices that yeah. they think they can. So like the reason I say it's not 1970 anymore is because this is an attitude that's often really prevalent in the Rust Belt, that the idea is the jobs were taken and they're and they're like, we have to move back. Yeah, the, the reason the jobs were located in the Rust Belt pre-1970 is transportation was a huge cost factor and there was no air conditioning. So like you can go get a job if you're if you feel like you're getting you might get laid off or whatever in in Michigan. You can go to South Carolina down to Auto Alley and go get a job. It's not going to pay as much, but the cost of living isn't as high. So like this is what I'm talking about is like there's like this lobby and think, people do you think people, it's more common people, that you'll need to work you'll need to find a job in a place with like where the cost of living is lower because I think it's at least as common if not more common where you in order to look for work in order to find jobs you need to start looking at places where the cost of living is higher and yeah there's a certain degree that is like there's a certain amount of like sacrifice that you can make but i think that there's at a certain point it becomes unreasonable if the only place you could find work in is a city and the closest place you could afford is two hours outside of the city is it reasonable to say well technically you can drive two hours to and two hours from work every single day to make a paycheck where you can afford this shitty little uh, apartment I, two hours away I, like I, is I, that like well I no hate, your life might suck no but no i'm not i'm not uh, the reason i'm laughing is because like two hours a day. That's nothing. Like I used to work in Manhattan. I used to have to commute like about two that time. hours, two, and two both, hours, both back. ways. First of all, I used to sell, I used to sell when I was like, uh, Do you when think I was that a that's kid, a reasonable expectation. Yeah, like you for, ought to be uh, able, willing uh, to like waste four hours of your day. That isn't free. Oh part, man. Four hours a day part, worth of gas. Part, part of me, but I'm a New Yorker. We commute more to work than any other group of people. So I'm like, you're speaking not, to someone I'm, with a four hour commute. Yeah, but I'm like, like I'm, I, I'm, I have a but I'm just saying, I'm, Fridays. I'm just saying, I'm not impressed by it. I used to have to take the bus like to a mall in a really terrible neighborhood in order to make sub minimum wage. And it used to take an hour and 45 both ways, assuming that when I got off bus one, the second bus was available. So I'm like, right, I, I guess we just had a different like, perspective. I have commute. a four hour, I have a four yeah. hour commute. Uh, now granted, it's just once a week, but I have a four hour commute, four hours that way, four hours the other way. And it kind of, it hits in my head. That's eight hours of gas that I have to, 
pay for. I it's mean, that's media, a lot. Of, it, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of time. I'm not. And I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm not saying that's common whatsoever, but I'm saying there's a certain point where like you can't just expect someone to do every single like make every sort of sacrifice in their quality of life in order to have a job. There is more to life yeah. than what you do for a living. And some of those things should take precedent. And some of those things we might want to consider helping people with instead Look, of just expecting people to make better choices. That that That's far away. And I would suggest, and by the way, there's people in the tri-state area that like commute like from Connecticut. I've heard horror stories of like long commutes, but like that's neither here nor there. Like I would suggest, or I would ask first, um, is your husband's job more local? And is that the reason why you haven't moved closer? Because like, Oh, and are you asking me personally? Yes. you personally. I, was, I was distracted for a microsecond. Yeah. It's local. And there's some other circumstances that are personal to us, which is the reason right. like it was actually the opposite. We moved away from where I, where I drive to. So I'm driving back to where we used to live. Right. So, okay. So, so and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that that is like, representative or common I'm, that's a that's a niche scenario i was just using it as a, a as a uh, uh an example of like there are uh in my opinion that fucking sucks dude that four-hour drive that fucking eats it out of you yeah, like you're I, tired your back hurts like it's boring uh like it, it kind of sucks without getting too much i'm, I'm not going to get into your personal situation so i understand if you made that decision for personal reasons like even though like I would I like I would have cautioned you against moving uh like that far but I'm sure there's a reason that is uh that probably like makes the commute worth it otherwise you probably wouldn't have done it like so well, yeah. and I'm saying so like that, yeah obviously someone who is in a shitty circumstances they see the, the decisions they make as worth it but that doesn't that's not a blanket excuse for that means we don't need to make things better. Right. If your choice is between working the worst job in the world or starving, you're going to pick the worst job in the world. That right. doesn't mean that doesn't mean we shouldn't advocate for better jobs, better conditions, more like more welfare, more social safety net. Like, I think that is a good thing that is going to lift people of all like it's going to lift people. Okay. And I don't okay. know why people are opposed to it. So, I mean, I mean, there's there's arguments about welfare being a trap, et cetera, et cetera. But like we're getting yeah, real if, far away from CRT. By yeah, the way. way, way far away. But. My, my also, point is, my point if it's is, okay my, with I'm sorry, I'll, you let's say your point in a sec. Is it okay like 20 more minutes? Is that fair? Uh, yeah, we're at like an hour 35. Like, we could we could wrap it on two hours. I, I'm gonna do super chats after, so we could wrap it in like 20 minutes and then I'll go through the chats. Cool. Yeah, that. let's let's aim for two hours on the, uh, the live podcast. Sure, all right, okay. so please, please, uh, continue. Um, yeah, we're way off CRT, but honestly, it's a it's an interesting discussion. I'll probably just retitle this like CRT and then, but uh, CRT and then. Yeah, I, I guess the 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 point I want to the the point I want to make is like you did make those decisions and you did them for reasons, and obviously if you could find a closer job you'd probably take it unless it's very like niche. But like it's not the point. Um, yeah, like most people don't like maybe like most people do make those kind of choices. Like they prioritize. So sometimes like uh, a longer commute is a substitute for for um, lower cost of living, et cetera, et cetera. So like, I'm fine with people making like those choices. Like, do I wish that your job live, like, you know, was closer to you that you didn't have to drive there because driving is dangerous? A hundred percent. But like, yeah, like those are choices that you made. And I think like people should be willing to do things like move or even take a longer commute than maybe like they, they feel comfortable with, maybe not eight hours, total back and forth like on the regular but like you know if that's what it takes like i think that's admirable uh, well we can say it's admirable but also but it's like one of those like those uplifting stories about the kid who had to like sell lemonade for five hours a day every day for a year and a half to pay for uh, his mother's like cancer treatment some people think that's super uplifting and some people think that's fucking crushing that's awful that is the worst thing i've ever heard in my entire life and so that's a, there's a different perspective, and I can see. Hey, it is cute. It is wonderful. Like it's a great. It's a story of a great person, and a terrible system in which they are having to like do more than what should be reasonable. The reason stories like that of overcoming adversity, of overcoming circumstance, the reason that they are uplifting is because that's a great individual. But we can have that conversation, commend that individual, also recognizing that they shouldn't have fucking had to do that. The circumstances should have been better, and we can make them better. We just choose not to for a very, very complex variety of reasons. Well, I, I, 
I, I would disagree with you on like what like what can actually be implemented from like a governmental level to ameliorate these circumstances. Like I don't I think the politicians are far less like competent and like capable I'm letting of you like, know changing front, the circumstances. I'm letting you know up front I'm an idiot and unless I have specifically done a lot of research on a on a topic, I won't know right. anything about it. Okay. So right. when it comes to like the effectiveness of government policies, I might have researched that. Right. But I've forgotten because it was more than 20 minutes ago. Then then like let's not let's not even let's like let's let's try to reel it back. Um good deal. On on and like try to bring it back to critical race theory, so, I guess. Yeah, we, we, so I got through one of the basic tenets of CRT. Right. Are you are you cool with like let's go through them one by one and see if there are sure. okay. How, uh, about, how about how about you like list them in like whatever order that you're you're doing and we'll okay, try I'll, to, like, I'll start over because it was like okay, so this is gonna be in order. So the first one is, first, racism is ordinary, not aberrational. Uh, let me get through at least three, and then we can go back through them. So first, racism is ordinary, not aberrational. Second, most would agree that our system of white overcolor ascendancy serves important purposes, both uh, psychic and material for the dominant group. And this is like paraphrased from the book. So um, if just, there's... If you just keep going. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. So the social construction thesis holds that race and, and races are products of social thought and relations, not objective, inherent, or fixed, or correspond to like biological or genetic reality. Right. There's uh, three more. Critical writers in law have drawn attention to the, uh, as well as in social science, have drawn attention to the ways the dominant society racializes different minority groups at different times. Uh, five, closely related to differential racialization is the notion of intersectionality. Uh, and anti-essentialism, I think that's important, with no person having a single, easily stated, unitary identity. And six is the one I, uh, I left off with. Coexisting in somewhat uneasy tension with anti-essentialism is saying the voice of color thesis, say that it's beneficial to have uh, voices of color, black voices, to speak on racial issues. Right. I can restate any of those if you have, if you have any no, particular no. problems. No, it's fine. It's it's those are like broader categories than like what I would have like exemption to. So um, I think the voices of color would fall into like the voices of under the voices of color would be like all the writing about cultural genocide or or um, you know uh, being like authentically within your race. I forgot what the exact phrasing is. I know, and those are there are uh, people out there who I would probably consider like. Oh, you're an idiot making everybody look bad. But here's a really interesting question that I think there's a lot of discussion, like good discussion. Who gets to determine what is and is not racism? And let's narrow it down even more. Who gets to determine who, what is and is not anti-black racism? White people or black people? And if there's a mix of the two, should we favor one over the other? No, I think I think you come up with I think you have a definition of it and like you, something either falls within that definition or doesn't like it's not well, definitions it's, are like well one who gets to come up with a definition I mean you have to like have an agreed to like definition which is a problem because like what most and, people's common understanding of racism is it's like discrimination or prejudice based on race but like the the I current had a big uh, conversation with uh, T Jump on what is transphobia so it's a really similar topic so I think that the, so shit, what was one of them was like racism is a shitty term, all right, because it encompasses so many disparate concepts that it's very, very easy for me to be talking about uh, systemic racism and you uh, to be talking about interpersonal bigotry. It's very easy for us to be both using the same term but talking about completely different things. And so it also points to the problem of like what is proper language? Like what is the proper definition of racism? Who gets to decide what that is? Is think, it white I, people? And is that and is that definition from like – I think you, been used I think, for the past sixty years or something. I think you need some. I think you need some form of like universality. Like you need the. You need to have principles that like apply. Like because if you just say black people can determine what racism is, then like you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that, something that simplistic, right? I'm. I'm just. I'm just giving an example. So if you just said that they get to determine what racism is, or what more commonly is said is. Uh, white people don't get to define racism, I guess is the, it, cause like people of color are bigger than just black people. Mm -hmm. Then that's like, why I didn't try to narrow it down to anti-black racism. Yeah. So then you're, you're left in a, in a situation you are, or, or anti-black racism. If we want to narrow it down there, if you say that black people get to define or white people get, don't get to define or non-black people don't get to define what anti-black racism is, then we're dealing with something that is intentionally designed to be subjective. If we're, if we're just saying that like it's, 
a consensus opinion or individual opinions of black people, then that is like inherently designed to be subjective, which kind of works this, back to this my- This worries me a lot. No, this worries me a lot. There's no objective definition of any word. There's no such thing as objectivity in language. There's no such thing as objectivity in concept. All of it is subjective. But a big problem is, <clears throat> and this is like where the like studies of whiteness, like what is considered normal is considered objective. And this is bad. This needs to be questioned. A lot of people like use like common sense. Like common sense is the marrying of what is considered normal and conflating that with objectivity. That's what common sense is. And so we need subjectivity. Racism, bigotry in general. I, I fought with someone like, oh my God, that debate was drove me to alcohol, which granted it doesn't take much to drive you to alcohol, but it's, you know, whatever. Bigotry does not have to be intentional. It doesn't have to be explicitly harmful. It doesn't have to be malicious. A lot of bigotry, in fact, probably most bigotry now is perpetuated out of this cultural inertia born of ignorance. Not everybody can know everything about every single person they encounter. Not everybody can know every single like nuance of a different culture that they're trying to interact with. Bigotry is going to happen. And one of the things I think would be great for every – if I – hey. Here's our, my reconciliatory, like uh, my, my big critique of the left. Not sometimes people are just fucking stupid. Okay, sometimes people are ignorant, and that includes you. And I, I, when I say you, I'm the pointing royal at you. my other, yeah, the royal you. Sometimes that includes you. All right, people fuck up. Like you are not your worst mistake. Like the worst thing you've ever done is not diagnostic of you as a person. We should know that. Fucking grow up. Okay. In, because I think that's way more useful than saying that if you're if you've done something racist, that means you're a bad person. Instead of hey, you grew up in a society. Did you know we live in a society, Sean? Yeah, you know we lived. Okay, cool. So a lot of when you grow up in a society, you have norms, you have a status quo, you have a lot of assumptions. They're going to be wrong, or they're going to be different from another person's. And I think that's 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 just what happens. And so there's a combination of like we need to recognize that like people don't have to be malicious to cause harm. And also like you might have some assumptions that you made that are worth questioning. The the answer to that is not always, you know, if you question something and don't change it, well you you must be wrong, but they're worth questioning. And so when we think of like what constitutes bigotry, I think it's worth not completely discounting the privileged group because, you know, those are the people that we need to talk with in order to, like, uh, help with racism. And racism and bigotry might not be uh, – they can it can happen within your own community. You can have internalized bigotry against your own group. But we all – I think it is good <coughs> to add a little bit more weight uh, of the opinions of, like, the people who are experiencing that bigotry, that specific bigotry. I think they get to have a little bit more say in what constitutes bigotry than people who are not a part of that group. And that's very, very broad. But I think that there's a rationality behind that that goes just beyond, well, I feel like this is the case. So so there's a lot in there. And I, I, I want to zero in on, I, I guess, a point of contention. So, I talked yeah. too long. Like, shut me up, okay? I talked no, too long. No, no. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to interrupt you. It's fine. Like, I, what, I, what I was going to say is, so, like, yes, you don't have to intend to cause harm to – to cause harm. Like I, I do obviously like I'm, I'm going to say, I agree with that. That's like the most nothing statement ever, but we do like typically put a greater weight on intended harm than, than like something that's inadvertent or accidental. And I think it, it, that's also it, another statement, right? Like, yeah. Of course I, we do. But I think it's important to like acknowledge that there's a, that there is an important distinction between like, maybe you used an outdated term and didn't mean anything like by it. And somebody took offense to that because offense is taken. It's not given versus you intentionally went after somebody and, and like, and they felt like the impact of you doing something that you intended to hurt somebody. And there's a great analogy from Jonathan. I, I love calling him Jonathan hate, but he's Jonathan height uh, from his book, uh, the righteous mind where um, he, he talks about how if you try to murder somebody, like if you took out your gun and shot at somebody 12 times, all the bullets missed, like you're going to go down for attempted murder and sure. your sentence will be stricter than, let's say, girl and a guy go out on a first date or guy and guy, it doesn't matter. And they have their first kiss and the girl ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich earlier 
and the guy has a severe peanut allergy, and then he ends up dying from the interaction with the peanut. Like, like, like he, <laughs> no, he well, this, this is the analogy that they gave. Like he objectively died. He was harmed more than the person who like matrix through all those bullets. But we understand and we put a greater weight on the intent to cause harm rather than impact in our society. And this is fine. And, for with, setting and with good reason. Yeah, but there's so th yeah, and yeah, that there's good reason. I would agree with you on all of that, but we're lacking a perspective here. All right. When you say offense is taken, not given, I think that's that's broadly true. However, what is the who like who gets to decide whether or not bigotry occurred? So this is another big thing that I talked about. Like what you feel like the, the recipient of bigotry, the recipient of that, that their perspective is just as important as the intent of the other person. Like that's how language works, right? I can make up like you, we were talking about this earlier. We need a common language and language requires a speaker and a listener in order to be considered language. I can't make up a new sound, decide it means something and communicate that to you. All right. There needs to be this back and forth. And what the listener, what the recipients interprets is just as valid as the intent of the person saying the thing. If we're, if we are to communicate as a society, now let's take those analogies, uh, and, and, by uh at their word let's take those analogies yeah we don't need to do anything different as a rule you don't get to try to kill somebody even if they uh deserve it okay uh you don't get to try to kill somebody attempted murder obviously i'm not like put that person away i'm not like abolish every single like no that's fine however even if it wasn't intentional a person still died and maybe there are things that we can enact in society that lets more people know that makes it less likely this is going to happen in the first place so we're not focusing on the intent of the person we're trying to focus on this person was ignorant. The girlfriend was not evil, but they were ignorant. And maybe if we had enacted policies in the past, put more information out there, maybe they wouldn't have been so ignorant that they caused this harm in the first place. And I think that we can do both, and we shouldn't treat them like the same thing. There shouldn't be a, a contest of like which one is worse uh, unless like in very specific scenarios. We can just look at them as both of them caused harm, and they caused harm in unique ways that we ought to approach differently. Uh, I. Look, I, I understand, and I'm, I guess, I guess it's like, uh, and I, I hate to like kowtow it in legal terms, but uh, I'm a big believer, obviously, and I'm sure you are, in innocent until proven guilty, right? And like, I like we have two different standards in the United States. We have uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, and like the preponderance of the evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Because we understand on some level that like accusation alone should not be like the determining factor and yeah, but I for think, like legally yeah I mean, but sure but like in civil cases we we do preponderance of the evidence which is more likely than not right so i i think that that's a good basis to start from because again i do feel like intent is i'm sorry offense is taken and like rather than like create but rather than develop like culture i'm not even talking about in terms of policy rather than like foster uh, this attitude of catastrophizing every like situation, like we should be trying to see like the good in people and we should give people the benefit of the doubt. Like, so like, what you say to all the parents who are like convinced, uh, who are being very, very offended by the anti-white bigotry of CRT, would you tell them that, well, are you really giving it the benefit of the doubt? All right. All right. They're not, they don't intend to cause anti-white racism. They're right, just right. taking that offense. So I like calm down. Uh, we need, like their well, intent matters more than your feelings, right? Well, I mean, it depends. So, like, a lot of the so I do videos on curriculums, and like, I, I'm not going to get too much into this because we're like brushing up on two hours. But, uh, like, if you're teaching Ibram X. Kendi, like, and I know he's disputed whether he's a critical race theory scholarship, but just for the point, if he if you're teaching Ibram X. Kendi and he says the only way to remedy past discrimination is for positive discrimination in front of black people, then that is like actually anti-white. Like it's like intentionally designed to. So let's take, bring it back to a justice analogy. All right, let's say that I'm robbing you. Okay, I'm breaking into your house and I'm stealing your uh, your uh, Warhammer figurines that I know you have. Uh, actually, I actually don't know. I'm stealing all your Warhammer figurines and I take them back to my house. Okay, now I stop. I don't do that anymore. Justice has been achieved. Not you not can't. You can't discriminate against me. You can't cause me harm by taking away my my newly found figurines, right? You no, not that justice, right? No, so I don't. I don't like this interpretation. Like positive discrimination. Like if 
historical circumstances has made it so where like white people have a disproportionate amount of wealth, a disproportionate amount of positions of power because of disproportionate education. And again, this is not anti-white. It's just recognizing like you can like the historical circumstances that led to this remedying that like if you take away someone's like feet and, and start them like uh, that's a that's a horrible analogy. I'm going to the standard analogy. So, if you if so, you make someone start fifty feet behind, you're not remedy like to so, pretend that because they're not there's no longer that barrier in the way, or that you're not pushing them back behind further. We haven't achieved any sort of like reconciliation. There's there's no justice there. There's just the absence of harm. So to to your point about the uh, like the the steely analogy, like the reason I I I think that's flawed is because we do have statute of limitations. Like you know if if like this is your i know it sounds like weird but like if this is yours for like generations then like eventually we let it go now murder doesn't have a statute of limitations etc cetera, etc cetera, but like you can't prosecute kids for the murders that their parents committed of course so not. like so we, like, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't approach it that way like to, I, I think it's i think it's to, incorrect to, uh, to say this that i think it's incorrect to say that like crt and people who are advocates of like affirmative action want to punish white people for the sins of their father what what they're trying to do is enact policies that don't favor white people anymore but, or that but don't to, favor to the, the uh, circumstances that have led to this uh like being a thing to the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, if like you were to steal from me now and like, you know, I would call police authorities, blah, blah, blah. I might pull an OJ Simpson and raid your hotel room and steal it back and then get 10 years because I killed somebody in the 90s and got away with it. But uh, like something, something right. Like like you you call some authority. But like if a certain amount of time passed by, like whatever the statute of limitations in the jurisdiction, like we would let that go. Like we would like because you can't there's a point beyond where you could remedy this. And the reason we do that is to protect the accused, which would be like you in that scenario, because like, if you could just bring up a prosecution at any point in time, at any point in the future, well, like, of course, the analogy wasn't to say that we should punish like future generations. The analogy was to say that like, you can't say that justice has been achieved. Like, like well, I didn't, I, I didn't so say it's been funny. achieved. If the, if the statute of limitations does pass, we can never say that justice has been achieved and the harm is still there. The material right. effects might still be there. But, and the way we prosecute individuals ought to be different than how we correct societal inequities. So I'm not, I'm, have, I'm, I'm not saying that justice would have been achieved uh, by like letting it go eventually. But what I'm saying is that there's a certain point where you can't rectify what was done and like we are talking about the sins of past generations and like what we should do now to current generations what if to we use, remedy uh, problems. What if we – yeah, what if we use more neutral language to like instead of saying the sins of past generations, we talk about historical historical circumstances that has led to this point in time that can be explanatory for why certain groups of people are concentrated in certain areas, why there are income inequalities, why there are gaps in education, why there are gaps in like job opportunity. We can use history and circumstance and even personal narrative. As, as, and alongside the data to help better explain these inequities so we can address policies more targetedly towards those populations to achieve better outcomes. I think that's a perfectly reasonable uh, like position, don't you? I mean, sure. I mean, you can make that case. Um, like, I, 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 I think one of the disputes, and we're not going to like resolve it, especially in like the five or so minutes that we have, is Bullshit. like how much think, of- Think more highly of yourself. We could do this. Come on. Is that how much how much of the gap, uh, how much of the gaps in our society, how much of the disparate outcomes can be attributed to past like racism versus individual choices? Because like I I'm 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 a big fan. One of the reasons why I'm like I do want more emphasis on history, specifically black history in the United States of America, is because black people did work to overcome discrimination in a bunch of circumstances that nobody talks about. So like in the, in the, uh, what you call it, in the forties to the sixties, and it might be the thirties to the fifties. So like, please mm -hmm. nerds on the internet, correct me. Like black people under Jim Crow lifted themselves out of poverty in an extraordinary rate. They went from 89% of their population in poverty to 49%. It's in, it's amazing. And this is while there was all this active discrimination happening. And that's not the first time that's happened with black Americans in the United States of America. They became literate in like a generation post-slavery. That's like almost never happened in recorded history. And like yeah. post-slavery, like to be clear though, the reconstruction era was better for black people than post-reconstruction. So like, it's not like, it's not like that was in the absolute worst times because so reconstruction was much better. 
do you think that there's a good dichotomy between like individual choices and racism? Do you think that those are cleanly separable? I think I think that people can make individual choices and we've seen through like we've seen through other groups in in other situations around the world that can actually overcome racism like the oh. Chinese that live in again, Malaysia. Again, we don't make policy decisions because some people can't no, overcome I, I, I think we should I think we should remove I think we should remove barriers as best as we can, right? But like the Chinese in Malaysia but are not just like, remove barriers. If there's harm being caused, removing a barrier but, is great. It's better than nothing. But what about like moving people back up to what would be considered neutral ground? Like I so I don't know. I don't I don't know how you do that without creating more violations of people's rights. And like the examples I'm trying to give are like the Chinese in Malaysia. Like they you can look to their laws. I don't know if it's still on the books today, but it was in like the 80s, 90s they have active discrimination quotas, all these things against Chinese people and Chinese people still represent like a ridiculously huge share of the wealthy and like the higher in, in society in terms of economic, in terms of outcomes, they do better. Yeah, so well, like the benefit it, of intersectionality, like it's showing that a group did well. That's great. Let's no, look at why they did well. Let's but, look at what their circumstances are. And let's not I'm assume because this different group did well, that means that this other different group could do well but, if only they tried harder and made better choices. I'm, but I'm, but the point I'm trying to make is that there can be explicit discrimination in the laws that is intended to cause harm, right? Chinese and Malaysia, excellent example. Sure. And like, it could not have that output. And I would be more concerned about the explicit discrimination and getting rid of that. Because to me, when people like, like when I hear story, when, when, I, when I examine the history of like black people overcoming in parts, obviously there was a lot of restrictions against them that they did not overcome. But overcoming in parts discrimination, I wanna remove the barrier so that I can see like what they can do. Like, because okay. it, it's, it, I, I don't want to, you know, what, I'm, I'm actually going to save the sports uh, analogy because it's where society isn't the meritocracy that yeah, like so sports. Are, I, I so. guess, I guess my response to that would be like, you shouldn't worry about CRT being taught in schools. Like, yeah, it might be a little bit harder for a couple of kids to do better, but remember you could just make better choices, choose not to believe in it. And like, you know, I, and eventually, eventually it won't matter. The statute of limitations will pass. That was a little bit jokey, but also like, I, I, I actually do think that um you should, you should, I actually do think it is empowering to teach students that they're, so I know you're joking, but I do think it is empowering to teach students that they are in control of their own destiny and that there are choices and you can show them the numbers that they can make to improve their outcome and set up their future generations for yeah, success. Great. Yeah, and, so, and one of those things that you can do with that individual choice is to address systemic inequalities. You can choose to address not just yourself, but try to make life better for other people by advocating for policy positions and proposals that are gonna make life better for everybody. That's one of the choices you could make. I mean, look, I, like that's when we would get into the argument about policy, but that's yeah. like we're 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 at two hours. It has so gone I, by really fast. Yeah. I, I, I hope you know that I've uh, I probably came off as a shithead because I always do, but I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed the the debate. I've had fun. I felt engaged. I stroked my beard a uh, beard a lot. <laughs> the the chat is always told a sign. Me. The yeah. chat has told me that you have stroked your beard a lot. It's a tick that I have. I'm sorry. I do it a lot. I really do. It's just my like, if I shave my beard, I do it anyway. Like, and it's like every time I touch my face, it's just like, no. I, it's, a, it's a tick that I have. Yeah. What I will say is I do appreciate you coming on. And uh, despite like initial, like, you know, off interactions in Twitter, but you can't really read tone. Every Pretty interaction... Fun. Every interaction that I've had with Justin has been positive. There's a reason that he appeared in my 100K special. And, like, I think that, like, even if I disagree with him, that he genuinely, like, wants things to be better. And, like, he, like, like it is legitimate concern. So, like, I see a lot of people that are being brutal in the chat. And, like, I... I, I would I would just say take it easy and like listen to where he's coming from. And it's good to have other people's perspectives. And I do appreciate you coming on. Cool. Thank you for having me on. I know it's been a long time coming. I had a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Uh, and and for 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 everybody, we're, we're, we'll have it on the record. I canceled the last time because of a personal issue. Before that, we had communications issue. But neither one of us are ducking neither one of us. All right. I, I will confirm that the, both of those statements. That, those were true. Okay. Thank you. Do you uh, do you want to close it up before? Because I'm going to stay on to read super chats, but I should give you the floor for a closing if you would like. So just like with every uh, debate, 
it's great that we get to like hash out like the individual points. There's a lot of research that I wasn't able to incorporate. That's the nature of debate. What I will try to do is that uh, I'm since I've done all this research, uh, I want to try to put it in video format, not addressing you, not being like a debate review, but I'm going to try to put these things in the best possible light. Uh, and I hope, even if you are being brutal to me, I hope it's clear that I've read a lot on this. I thought about a lot on this and maybe I just came to a different conclusion than all of you. So I'll put out a video like outlining the, uh, the research that I've done, the studies that I've collected and a, hopefully a more like uh, a way where, uh, where Sean just can't like interrupt me and like take me out of my zone, you know, uh, yeah. But I'll try to put out uh, a video with like, all the information that I've been uh, able okay. to collect. I'll put on a cool costume to make Every it in mood lighting, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. So uh, Justin's links are in there. Definitely, like, go over, check him out. Like, again, obviously, we're not aligned politically, but, like, he puts work into his channel against 70 sources. Like, you guys know I'm, I've become a stickler for citing sources, but I've never cited 70 of anything ever. So, um, yeah, definitely check him out, like get his perspective and without like the back and forth. Cause you know, part of this is like, we compete for time and we address each other's points and we don't get to communicate everything. There are benefits and drawbacks say. of both. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, so, yeah. that's why you should do both. You should listen to both. All right. So thank you so much for your time, Justin. I'm going to read super chats and, uh, yeah. Cool beans. It was good having you. Uh, neat. I don't know how to end this by end looking cool. I don't know <laughs> you, how to like look cool as I exit. So I'm just, there you go. <laughs> All right, that was that was interesting. I'm, I'm. We did get off into a bit of a tangent, like, um, we started like talking about stuff that were not related to critical race theory, but it wasn't like uh, what I would typically, the the tangents we would typically get at. Like, I, I have to give Justin credit is that he didn't seem like he was avoiding for the sake of avoiding so like i think like he he was trying to give like a counter perspective and i do appreciate that so um i saw somebody by the way in the chat say that um that, that at some point i'm gonna bring uh sam cedar on when i come back which is hilarious and i actually hope justin saw that because he was he, he really enjoyed the sam cedar thing let me pop up these headphones though like i i can't stand wearing headphones ugh, for hours but yeah, I'm gonna pull up the super chats and uh, we'll we'll talk about that. And you guys are gonna laugh at my terrible dyslexia, which causes bad reading skills. So that that will be fun. But yeah, let me see the uh, the general chat atmosphere. <laughs> Somebody said, "I give him no points. May God have mercy on his soul." That's really uh, that's really that's really not nice. Um. What's interesting is like, you know, there's there's always a thing with Justin, like which Justin are you gonna get? So like if you watch him in um in I think the first myth informed, like you got the calmer Justin, and the second one you got the more aggressive Justin. And I think here he was like trying to make his point sharply without like you know coming off like as like needlessly rude, which I don't think he was rude at all. And I actually appreciate him coming off. Oh my god. Okay, I think I found the the beginning. All right, so I did find the beginning of the, 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 what you call it. I did find the beginning of the super chats. <laughs> this lexic of the world unite. Um, there's one up here. Let me see if I can find that. Okay. Uh, hello, Sean. Hello, Sean. Great show. I wish you got more time to talk and get your points out because my fr uh, it's my first live show. Have you heard of Eldarian Psychology? And mainly about the three pillars. More people should hear about it. Cheers. Uh, two dumb gamers. Thank you for the super chat. I've not heard about that, honestly. Like the way the way that I typically learn new things is when people uh, like it becomes a thing, and then I have to research it, and then I know way too much about it. So yeah, I have not heard of that. Somebody says my microphone is clicking. Is it? How about now? Is it better? You know what might be happening. Okay. Is that better now? Is my microphone better? Check, 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 check. Is the microphone better? 
Okay. All right. Thank, thanks, CJ. All right. So, all right. I'm going to go through the Super Chats. Let me just, like, reorient myself because I am not oriented correctly. Actually, I can. I actually did the thing. That was smart. Oh, no. That was so dumb. That was, like, the most dumb thing I've ever done. And I did it, like, right in front of everybody. I unplugged my camera thinking it was something that I didn't have to unplug. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Come on, come on, come on. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I went to move the computer close to me, and then I was like, what's that USB thing? And then I uh, I unclicked it. So, yeah, yeah, not not a great plan. Not 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 the best uh, maneuver on my part. All right, let's 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 go to this uh, super chat. Uh, let's see. Oh, my God, I lost my place. How do I make this bigger? I got, I got terrible eyesight. We'll go. There we go. There we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. Nice and easy to see. Okay, scroll, 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 scroll. Yeah. So, I don't know. It was interesting. I find that a lot of the CRT debates don't actually end up being much about CRT. Um, at least Justin. I think Justin was reading the same book that uh, Sitch was reading. So, like, that's good. All right. So, all right. I got my thing up here. Somebody sent me a new chat. Let's let's read them in ascending order. I'm proud of your sponsorships. Uh, for your fan, and I'm proud of you. Also, I don't think he can understand what you say. Uh, I don't think he can understand what you say. Language is an objective. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very, very funny, guys. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, the first Super Chat is from Tuesday Money. It's for $5, and it says blank. Nothing at all. Um, the second chat is from en Enrique Padilla. And it says, who is worse, ANCAPs or ANCOMs? Obviously, ANCOMs, because ANCAPs believe in private property rights. Communists don't. Therefore, they're bad. Uh, somebody says, his interruptions make it seem like make it seem like you are making points that you aren't. And then it sucks because you're defending them, blah, blah, blah. It's a conscious tactic, though. I mean, look, I, I can, like, harass on the... Uh, I can harass based on like the interruptions or stuff like that, but like, it's not gonna, you're just gonna get bogged down in like stupid details. Like, I feel like when I need to harp down on a point, like I'll re-ask the question without being like a jerk about it. Uh, Sean, you would be based if you are an ANCAP, please. When are you gonna be advocating for anarcho-capitalism? Government has a monopoly on violence. Uh, I'm not an ANCAP, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to start apologizing like a Canadian. Uh, this was much better than the surf. So Lance will probably be a CNN reporter when he's older. Um, yeah, Justin is way, Justin's way more interesting to talk to than a guy like the surfs because like Justin is confident in the information that he displays. Like this is why I was saying like he has his positions. I disagree fundamentally with his positions and we could end up shouting at each other. Like it's a possibility, but he's confident in what he believes and I'm confident in what, and what I believe. And there's at least an attempt to understand each other's positions. The surfs is a guy who's like not confident. Like he, you know, one of the criticisms that he gave in his little pre-written debate, like a, uh, like outro was he's like, you're so confident. It's like, that's not a bad thing. Like delivering the, like, I think I said it was the confidence associated with being a man, which is mean of me to say but like, yeah, when you're not confident, that's when you have to desperately like try to misstate everything and you have to like injure people. Like you have to like try to go for people's credibility. Like if the surfs was confident in his arguments, he wouldn't be desperately trying to like frame me as a racist so that he could dismiss my arguments. Like if he felt like that he could counter them, he would be countering them. So Justin isn't like that. I, you know, and Justin might have similar views like that beneath the surface. I might be that same person, but he's like confident enough to confront what I'm actually saying or to confront what, like try to confront what I believe rather than like a character attack. 
Uh, Kyle D. Bear says, great work as usual, man. Keep it up. Here, have a nickel bag. Oh, God. Uh, Zach, the Celtics guy, says, I agree with what you said to me in the beginning. This is the most cringe thing I've ever seen, at least from Vox anyway. Whoa, whoa. Oh, no. I'm reading Super Chats from the wrong place. Oh, no. Okay. Toasty sends the first Super Chat. Uh, don't walk away. Don't walk an AJW in the same room. Were they different people all along? Um, yeah, me and Andrew are different people. And uh, yeah, uh, he doesn't have, he doesn't know that IQ measures problem solving. What What is this? Oh my God. Oh, okay, okay. So let, let me let me just tell you that I'm, I'm big smart, like high 10,000 IQ. And what I was doing was, is I was reading the super chats, but since you guys sent new ones, it moved them down or moved them, yeah, whatever. And uh, I was reading the super chats from my premieres, which is stupid. Okay, so NM sends a $5 super chat from Canadian land. It is blank. Adam Friended, $10. Stop debating, Sean. It's too hard. Uh, Adam Friended, go check out his channel. He's a good guy. Uh, Memphis DePay, $4.99 US dollars. Jennifer Ho, professor of critical race theory, according to her Twitter at Colorado, says black attacks on Asians are fueled by white supremacy. We've heard that before, and that's not surprising. It's the idea that like any time there's like interperson of color racism or violence, that is a product of like a white supremacist system that's controlling them. So, you know, somebody said it's list dyslexia. <laughs> you guys are, you guys are uh, clever, more clever than I give you credit for. Uh, somebody says, look up F.A. Hayek on social justice to make people equal. A goal of government policy would force the government to treat people very unequally indeed. I mean, that's basically the point I was making. I just didn't reference like Hayek specifically. Uh, you would win against Jenks' nephew in a boxing match. Look, I'm not. Don't be. Jenks' nephew is like six foot four. Why you got to be honest. That would I. Would I train for it to try to win if such a thing were to occur and I was paid a ton of money? Sure. But like he's six foot four. He's a big guy. Uh, Roman TV gave me 25 rons. I don't know what that is. Colorblindness means that you should pe treat people based on their character. It doesn't mean that you can't be aware of racism. Racism exists. Yeah, this is like like colorblindness as an ideal is not is not a bad thing in the way that it's often portrayed. And it's not like stupid. Like people try to say, oh, well that's a colorblind instance of discrimination. It's like, no, you're trying to treat people based on their individual character and like deal with issues of racism as they come up rather than presupposing that people are like automatically treated different with uh, because of race. Um, Enrique Padilla says, I think segregation is fine. We should segregate Oh, I'm not reading that blast part, but it says segregate commies. Uh, but it says something else that I can't uh, do that. Um, I, I am in favor, not of what Enrique said, but of sending the commies to the socialist paradise that is Venezuela. I will take 10 Venezuelans that are sick of socialists and uh, and for for every Antifa member that, they, that goes and lives in their paradise. 10 to 1. But I, I'm not reading that. Sorry. Um... Roman TV, again, 25 rons. You can be state blind and treat people from Texas the same like people from Illinois, but you can still be aware of some states being better than other ones. Eh, not the best analogy. Um, Enrique says also, I'm not reading that either. Enrique, throw in the fire. It says Justin can assimilate something and something, something. So, yeah. Uh, not here for 420. Hey, H3. H3, if you're watching this, this is how to debate. All right. All right. Uh, Rumpley Depew says, you need to apologize to every Italian <laughs> who has the first name Tony PD, Tony PD Sal, last name that ends in a vowel, and a middle name that starts with the. Oh my God. That's for me talking, trying to move, like trying to use the Ebonics example, but maybe like take the color out of it and make it more cultural. Jesus. Hitting the Italians hard. I love my New York Italians. I, I'm, I'm, I joke, I, but I joke because I love. Like that, that's, 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 how, that's how I am. Um, 
and I lost my place in the supers, but you know, yeah, 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 that happens. Uh, okay, I found it. Uh, Roman TV, uh, Ron $25, whatever that Ron currency is, I'm gonna look it up later. It's gonna be worth like 12 cents, but thank you, Roman TV. Uh, who gets to decide what proper, what proper English asks the leftist who has no problem figuring out what racism or offensive is? I mean, I, he was arguing about what is actually racism or offensive. Uh, Sean, love you, but this guy chased me off. He, it's a ridiculous point of view. Ask him, ask, ask him this question for, for, for me. <laughs> oh my God. You know, if it wasn't for that one guy that docs Bosch, I would be bringing up these super chats on the screen so that you could read him. So this guy wrote, ask him this question number four, me. Spell question QW, so it's like an ebonics joke, and I'm totally in favor. Daniel Lee nailed it. Uh, C, five US dollars. It would be great if you could collaborate with Rob Noer from Twitch. You're both great and and crushing lefties. Maybe that's supposed to be at. Uh, Roman TV, again. Romanian TV, again. I'm scared to say that if I don't want racism in the schools, a postmodernist gaslighter would say, what about, would say, but what is fascism? Can we really define it? Mm. Uh, five US dollars from a guy named Stug. Great, now we supposedly have an academic field which is defined by not having a common idea. So yeah, this is, a, this is an issue that I often run into with the critical race theory types. And I try to bring it up every single time that Justin was, uh, I felt he was going into that territory, is that like, you bring up an issue that's related to critical race theory and they try to like de-emphasize that. And I don't think Justin was the worst at it, but like now with that, it's like the third time I've been doing this conversation with like a left-leaning person, like you notice it more and more. Like you don't, you don't really know how they're going to counteract what you're going to say until you see it multiple times. And yeah, there is a lot of that and it's really, you know, we didn't even get to, into like the curriculums that were actually being implemented. We got stuck on commuting, um, but yeah. Uh, Roman TV schools are designed to help students find a job in life. Science does that. Can you say the same about CRT? Uh, yeah, this was part of my thing about like this learning proper English because all the scholarship and textbooks is written in proper English. Like, will better arm you to succeed in life. Um, to Toby Walker says respect to both of you for. For the live debate thank you toby walk for the chat uh mr blank two dollars says coke training employees to be less white i mean that's so we were pretty much talking about education and like public education not necessarily uh uh in in like the workplace or all these other implementations so like that's a little different i think like you can end up suing maybe coca-cola for subjecting you to something racist and maybe this gets worked out in the courts and that's the way that could be removed but in terms of curriculum, like parents are supposed to have an influence on their school boards, which determines the curriculum. And again, like children versus adults, like we have different standards for a reason. Um, so Chris Jones in reference, I guess, to the Holocaust is saying, yeah, the, there's a huge difference there. And that's that that many of the Jewish people got genocided during the Holocaust. Um, uh, Zach Tenner, thank you for the sticker. I don't know what that sticker even is, but thank you. Um, Ben Flebel says, uh, Stalin's granddaughter, she's all American and shouldn't be made to pay for Stalin's evils. Ask if she should pay reparations to UK Americans or, you know, Ukrainians. Uh, S Frank Ambergers with five euros or pounds sterling. I don't know. I don't know. Symbol says SJW debates is one giant mot. So this is like Mott and Bailey. Um, Utter nonsense for 199 AJW, you're one of the best. Congratulations on 100K subs. Honestly, I'm really happy with the 100K subs. It's actually really improved, like, algorithm suggestions and all these other things that nobody told me it would improve were improved. So that's really cool. Uh, Mr. White Male, 499 US, how much, how much suffering does white people need to be inflicted on them? Well, I would argue that, like, making people today to suffer to get cosmic justice and remedy something from the past is not moral. Um, and I think that's where his like stealing analogy broke down when it's like, yeah, we have a statute of limitations. Like you can only go back so far. When we did reparations to Japanese people that were interned, 
we paid people who were interned. We didn't pay people who weren't interned. Um, Camero, Camer Zero, Camer Zero, maybe Camer Zero, whatever. Um, postmodern theory is a death cult. We can only have true equity after we're all dead. I mean, I guess we're all equal in the ground. Uh, Hydro something X, which I think might be old friend Hydro PX, and it says dumb slash B people with degrees. Uh, Hydro PX again. How would you force everybody to be equal, even if you give them better choices? Well, that's my issue. Is I don't think e unequal outcome is inherently like bad or negative. Like I think it, it's what we see in the world. Uh, Kevin Simmons for five dollars. Can't watch live. Hoping to see this tomorrow. Thanks for the work, Sean. Uh, did you hear about Ethan and Crowder? Ethan made another heel turn, bringing back Sam Cedar, whoever that is. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, uh, Miguel, I did see that. Thank you for the chat. How strong we sure? Oh yeah. So okay. So I'm at the top. Let's see if there's any new ones. I'm gonna refresh, and like I can wrap it up. Oh. Sore shoulder, my like curse mark, and then yeah, I'm totally bumping my mic. Like normally, I angle this like a little better, so I don't bump it as much. Uh, let's see. All right, I'm gonna check for some new ones, and then like I'm gonna like wrap. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, so somebody said I was proud of your sponsorships. Uh, uh, Sean, you would be so based if you were an ANCAP. I, I think I already read this. Advocating for blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I did read that one. Okay, so somebody said way much better than the surfs. Yeah, obviously, I read that one. Uh, Ethan, for $5, look up FA Hike. I read that one. Oh, my God. Uh, Julian Gitter Gian Grande? Sorry, Sean, I didn't mean to upset you. You didn't upset me. And uh, Ray, Rad Track 5 for $2. Read some hop, <laughs> read some Hopian and you'll be an ANCAP. I don't know what that is. I, I will just say that. I don't know what that is. But yeah, um, yeah, that's 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 basically it. I'm 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 ready to wrap it up. Uh, it was fun. Um Thanks everybody for joining. Um, I don't know how to end this stream, guys. Oh, also, look, look, I made this new. I got this new shirt made for me. It's going to be available in my Teespring store very soon. It's Slipper Sean, a nickname that we were gotten given to us by a very good friend of the channel. So, so, just, just wait for the advert on that. But yeah. Um, yeah. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Blah, 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 blah. Till next time. And then I hit end broadcast and then ask me again and that delays the thing.